Hello, fellow misfits. It's the end of another week and we just hit 20, 1,000 subscribers. Thank you for your support. Tonight we'll explore the unexplained and the macabre. Prepare to have your spine chilled, your heart race and your mind tormented with tales of terror and unsettling encounters. Subscribe now and join our sinister circle as we uncover the horrors. And now... Story time. I'm a U.S. soldier. This was a day like any other as we traveled through the dense forest in our convoy, descending a nearby logging road. We had heard rumors about strange creatures in the area, but none of us had ever seen any evidence ourselves, so we didn't think much of it. As we approached a quarry, I suddenly caught sight of something extraordinary. Three massive, bipedal hominids covered in black or very dark brown hair from head to foot were standing near the edge of the clearing. The middle creature was the tallest, about seven to eight feet tall, and it was flanked by two slightly shorter ones, standing around six to seven feet tall. I couldn't believe my eyes. The tallest creature stood very still, while the other two seemed to rock side to side, shifting their weight from one foot to the other. They appeared to be observing our convoy with great interest. I wasn't the only one who saw these creatures. Sergeant. Jeff Martin, another member of our convoy, had actually witnessed the same three beings about 30 minutes earlier. He had observed them leaving the quarry, and they had moved with a graceful, fluid, glide-like stride, accompanied by exaggerated arm swings. Sergeant. Martin noted how they seemed to cover an impressive amount of distance with just a few steps. We were all astonished by our encounter with these elusive creatures. It was clear that they were intelligent and curious, and they seemed to have a keen interest in our movements. We couldn't help but wonder what they were thinking as they watched us from a distance. As we continued our journey, the sighting left a lasting impression on all of us. We couldn't shake the feeling that we had just witnessed something truly extraordinary, a glimpse into a world that few people ever get the chance to see. It was February 6, 1993, and I decided to head back to the same area where I had encountered something strange before. This time, I was accompanied by Jennifer, Chris, Don, and my girlfriend. We were all curious to see if we could find any evidence of the mysterious creature with amber glowing eyes I had seen previously. We found ourselves near a dump, just east of the Bergsvik Creek fish hatchery. It was said that maybe Bigfoot scooped fish from the hatcheries, which piqued our curiosity even more. The day before, there had been a massive storm with winds reaching up to 80 miles per hour. As a result, we had to drive slowly due to the broken limbs scattered across the road. As dusk approached, we were about 150 yards from the dump when the mysterious creature appeared again. It walked behind our car, and I could see it clearly through the backup lights. The amber glowing eyes were unmistakable. It looked like the same creature I had seen before, as I recognized the gray colors on its body. The next day, we decided to return to the scene with a police officer and his German Shepherd dog, hoping to find some evidence of the creature's presence. However, as soon as we arrived, the dog refused to get out of the truck. There was a strong, dead smell in the air that seemed to frighten the dog. Though our encounter was brief, it left us all with a sense of wonder and excitement. We couldn't help but think about the possibility of a mysterious creature, like Bigfoot, roaming the woods in our area. Our experience served as a reminder that there are still many unknowns in this world, and sometimes, the most unexpected moments can turn into unforgettable adventures. It was May 18, 1993, when I, Mark Port, stumbled upon mysterious tracks once again near the Green Peter Dam, close to Lebanon, Oregon. The tracks measured approximately 14 by 5 inches, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement and curiosity as I examined them. I recalled a similar experience I had while hunting near John Day, Oregon, back in 1990 and 1993. I remembered being deep in the woods, 
surrounded by the sounds of nature, when I suddenly heard something unusual. It was a strange noise, like the rubbing of sticks back and forth. The peculiar thing was that it sounded like several individuals were doing it. The noise was persistent and eerie, sending a chill down my spine. As I stood by the Green Peter Dam, reflecting on those past experiences, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something out there, something that had left those tracks and made those mysterious sounds. I felt a mixture of intrigue and fear, wondering what kind of creature could be responsible for the traces I had discovered. Determined to learn more, I decided to investigate further. I ventured deeper into the woods, following the trail of tracks as best as I could. The forest was dense, and the deeper I went, the more mysterious it felt. The sounds of the woods seemed to grow quieter as I approached the source of the tracks. Then, as I stepped over a fallen log, I heard it again, the sound of sticks rubbing together. My heart raced as I realized that whatever had made those tracks and those sounds was nearby. I cautiously moved forward, scanning the trees and underbrush for any sign of movement. As the sound grew louder, I knew I was getting closer to the source. I held my breath, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature responsible for the tracks and noises. But just as I was about to lay eyes on it, the sound abruptly stopped, and the forest fell silent. Frustrated and unnerved, I decided it was time to head back. I had come close to discovering the truth, but it seemed the mysterious creature wanted to remain hidden. My name is Alex, and I'm an experienced park ranger with years of service under my belt. I never could have imagined the terrifying ordeal that awaited me when I agreed to lead a team of scientists and archaeologists on an expedition to study an ancient Native American settlement in a remote, uncharted area of the national park. As we delved deeper into the ruins, the atmosphere grew heavy with a palpable sense of history. The settlement was remarkably well-preserved, a testament to the ingenuity of the people who had once called it home. But as we continued our exploration, we stumbled upon a horrifying scene, the bodies of over 50 people, all brutally slaughtered. It soon became apparent that the settlement had been ravaged by a long dormant supernatural creature, a wendigo that killed people on sight. The mere mention of its name sent shivers down our spines, and we knew that we had to find a way to stop the creature before it could wreak further havoc. As we searched for answers, we found a series of runes etched into the walls of a hidden cave. The symbols told the story of the Wendigo, its origins, and most importantly, the method to banish it from this world. With no time to lose, we worked together to decipher the runes and perform the ritual needed to rid the world of the Wendigo. The air crackled with energy as we recited the ancient incantation, and the Wendigo let out a blood-curdling scream that echoed throughout the settlement. As the creature writhed in agony, it finally vanished, banished from this realm by the power of the ancient magic. But as we stood among the ruins, our relief was tempered by the knowledge that we were too late to save the lives of those who had fallen victim to the Wendigo's wrath. The settlement, once a thriving community, now stood as a haunting testament to the dark forces that had brought about its demise. As we returned to the park, the weight of our discovery weighed heavily upon us. The ancient settlement and the tragic fate of its inhabitants would remain a somber reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden within the depths of the national park, and the darkness that sometimes lurked just beneath the surface of our world. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know, when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food, so it doesn't feel threatened anymore and attacks a human. They all know it wasn't a bear though, bears don't leave wounds like that, and they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a bit about myself. Now, I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer. Anyway, that's partially why I'm posting this, I need to tell somebody else about this story, 
And like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everybody is used to weird happening in the woods, but this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forests. Growls, yipping, even human-sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. All pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals thieve food, make weird noises, and even the human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So we sent our veteran backcountry ranger, Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years, was an expert outdoorsman, and was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped into the task, always eager to go into the backcountry, even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal, a flashlight in his backpack, inside a small cave near the location of his body a couple of days after he didn't return, and we had sent out a search party to find him. I haven't shared this journal with anyone, not even the other rangers, until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden, other than that the truth seems so messed up and unreal, I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything I'm going to read to you he had written down over the two days he was out on his backcountry excursion. October 21st, 2011, Day 1. Today was a long day, and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day, starting down in the gully where the reports first started and ending up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Bald Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier, I found some tracks in the ground in the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone, but maybe it was separated from its herd or dying. It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere, so I abandoned them. Near the tracks was a pervasive smell of death, and I'm assuming a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can't catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22, 2011, morning of day 2, quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night, one of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No lights, so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be. Last October 22, 2011, night of day two. Stopped for the night in the valley, cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. Dead tired, and I'm getting too old for this. No progress on the hikers, and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, 2011, night of day two, second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try and block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. Got the cave entrance cracked 
covered with a large rock and some brush. It will have to do. The beast is still outside, clawing at the crack in the rock. Don't think I'll sleep tonight anyway, not after what I saw. I might as well record this because these might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall, and possibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier, when I had left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing, and suddenly everything went silent. No voices, no hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet, knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up by my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. The thing dragged me up right against the tree, and I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. The agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and prepared myself to die when a crash in the distance distracted the beast long enough for me to make a break for it. I ran for my life and I didn't look back but knew it wasn't far behind me. About 20 feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside, I could hear it shuffling around trying to get into the crack and I could hear the heavy breathing, the sucking gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again, I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with the putrid smell of impending death. If I make it through the night, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range, but after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looks like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks more specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gate matches something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged 70 feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there, his arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strewn around the base of the tree. The jagged shadow remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing, but not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day and a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found. Those scraps of clothing matching what they were wearing have been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear attack. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area but we still hear reports of humans sending voices coming from the woods. And we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. They are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig was, broken warnings to other hikers who dare intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. My name is John a seasoned park ranger assigned to mentor a rookie named Ethan on his first assignment. We ventured deep into the remote back country of the vast national park, eager to pass on my knowledge and experience. Little did I know, our routine patrol would quickly become a harrowing fight for survival. We stumbled upon a series of gruesome animal killings that defied any logical explanation. The carcasses were left in a manner that suggested no known predator was responsible. As we investigated further, we discovered the existence of a pack of supernatural predators that could blend into the shadows, moving silently and unseen. These creatures were unlike anything we'd ever encountered, 
and their mere presence sent a chill down our spines. Ethan and I knew we had to overcome our fears and rely on our skills to outwit these elusive predators. Our priority was to alert the public to the danger lurking within the park's borders, but we knew we needed to act fast. We devised a plan to lure the creatures into a trap, using our knowledge of the terrain and animal behavior to our advantage. Unfortunately, our plan did not go as smoothly as we had hoped. As we managed to ensnare the predators in our carefully laid traps, Ethan became separated from me. I heard him cry out, and my heart sank as I realized that my young protege had fallen victim to the creatures we were trying to stop. Despite the pain and guilt that weighed heavily upon me, I pressed on, capturing the remaining predators. As I stood there, mourning the loss of Ethan, a government helicopter suddenly arrived. Before I could react, a group of armed agents emerged and locked me in, taking the captured predators with them. I demanded answers, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. The helicopter took off, leaving me with a sinking feeling that I would never learn the truth about the creatures or the government's involvement. After that day, no one ever saw or heard from me again. My disappearance became one of the many mysteries that haunted the park, a chilling reminder of the unknown dangers lurking in the shadows. Two years ago, I found myself on an elk hunting trip with three of my buddies. We had set up camp near Ukiah, Oregon, or at least that's what I think it was. The days were spent scouting for elk, and the evenings were filled with laughter, storytelling, and of course, drinking screwdrivers around the campfire. One particular night, as we sat around the fire, we were all in high spirits, sharing our adventures from the day. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a loud, undulating scream echoed through the forest, cutting through our laughter and chilling us to the bone. It was unlike anything any of us had ever heard before, and it sent a wave of fear through the camp. Instinctively, we all jumped up and ran for our guns, our hearts pounding in our chests. The adrenaline coursed through our veins as we frantically scanned the dark woods surrounding the camp, trying to pinpoint the source of the terrifying sound. As we stood there, weapons at the ready, we caught a glimpse of a large, shadowy figure moving swiftly through the trees. The sheer size and speed of the creature was enough to make us believe that it was a Sasquatch, a creature we had all heard stories about but never truly believed in until that moment. Just as quickly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the darkness, leaving us all standing there, dumbfounded and shaken. We gathered around the campfire once again, our previous mirth replaced by a sense of unease. We spent the rest of the night discussing the incident, trying to rationalize what we had experienced. Over time, the memory of that night has faded, but the feeling of fear and awe that the scream evokes still lingers. We've shared our story with others, some of whom believe us, while others dismiss it as a product of our overactive imaginations and too many screwdrivers. I'll never forget the night of September 9, 2015. It was around 11.40 p.m. And I was driving up Route 43 towards the peaks of Otter. I was just passing Turkey Mountain Road when something strange caught my eye. My headlights hit a figure that seemed out of place. It wasn't until I got closer that I realized what it was. I knew what I saw was going to sound crazy, but I had to call Bedford County Dispatch. I told them that I saw a Bigfoot with a baby. The dispatcher was understandably confused and asked me to repeat myself. I insisted that I wasn't drinking and that I saw what I saw. Two days had passed since the sighting, and I felt like I had to share what I witnessed. When I went back in daylight, I saw footprints that were larger than anything I could make. The creature's stride was longer than anything I had ever seen. The footprints were bigger than my two feet put together, end to end, and I wear a size 8 shoe. The creature was holding its baby just like a human would, and the baby was looking right at me. I later described the baby as looking just like Chewbacca from Star Wars. The dispatcher asked me if they had received any other calls like mine before, but he had never heard anything like it. A deputy checked out the area and didn't find anything. 
I know they were not bears. I can't explain what I saw, but I know what I saw. The memory of that night will stay with me forever. I have heard many rumors of a monstrous creature born in the mountains, about 15 miles away from our city. The people living there are said to be deeply superstitious and almost untouched by civilization. The creature, which was born about two weeks ago, has caused a great deal of terror and dread among the mountaineers. They believe that the devil has appeared among them, in the form of the monster that was born in their midst. Recently, rumors of the creature have reached our city, and those who have dared to visit it describe it as being somewhat larger than an average newborn, covered in short, black hair, and dark in color, despite having a white father and mother. From either side of its head grow short horns, and it has a long tail that resembles a cloven hoof. To the mountaineers who have seen it, it is the very picture of the devil. There are many stories about the incidents surrounding the creature's birth, but one stands out. It is said that the father of the creature had some religious beliefs, which he tried to impose on his wife, who did not agree with him. She declared that she would rather see the devil than have a cross always before her eyes. Shortly after this, she gave birth to the monstrous creature. In terror, the father summoned several neighbors, and one of them, more brave than the rest, offered to kill the creature by bleeding it to death. As he took out his knife, the creature raised itself, got down from the bed, and walked across the room, addressing the would-be executioner in terrible language and threatening him with dire consequences if he attempted to harm it. It then declared that it would live for seven days, and having revealed its purpose for coming into the world, it would then die. As strange as it may sound, this story has many believers, and few dare to go near the little cabin in the mountain where the poor mother of the miserable creature lives. The creature lived for seven days and died on the last Monday, the eighth day, without ever speaking again. Its birth and death have filled the mountaineers with such uneasiness that they shun the cabin and its inhabitants. I sat on a wooden barstool behind the register in the nastiest gas station I've seen before or since. It was my third night in a row on the graveyard shift, despite my constant pleas for daylight hours. At night, the place became purgatory. No matter how hard you'd scrub or how many times you'd mop, a thick film of filth remained on every surface. I would go hours without seeing a single car drive past, I often questioned if the rapture happened and I was the only one left. We were a stone's throw from another 24-hour gas station franchise that was cleaner, properly lit, and had an equipment update within the last decade. Needless to say, I had a lot of downtime. It was half past midnight, I had six and a half hours to kill. I was reading from the first volume of Johnny the Homicidal Maniac and doing my best not to look at the clock. As I would soon learn, I was being irresponsibly unaware of what was going on around me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a brown wood panel station wagon pull up to a pump. Two men exited the car and walked inside. One looked older, he was wearing a leather jacket the same shade of brown as his vehicle. The younger guy was close to my age, he wore a faded Carhartt coat and work boots. Both were covered in a layer of dirt or dust that suggested recent manual labor. These were country gentlemen. I greeted them and asked what I could help them with. They told me they're not interested in buying anything but they had to stop by and make sure everything was okay here. I was appreciative albeit visibly confused. The younger man asked me, did you know you're being watched? As he subtly gestured outside. Sure enough, I saw the dark outline of a man standing completely motionless near a streetlight. None of his features were visible but I could tell he was staring directly at us. The older man said they had been driving by 45 minutes earlier and almost hit him as he was standing in the middle of the road. He theorized the man was possibly on drugs. They decided to take the long way home that night to see if the guy was still hanging around. Mind you, this was 45 minutes after they almost ran the guy over. Had he been watching me that entire time? I looked outside again to find he hadn't moved a muscle. 
He was positioned on the border of the streetlight's illumination, I noticed his jaw was moving like he was saying something. I asked the younger man to lock the deadbolt on the front door, literally my only line of defense in this situation. They both agreed to wait with me in the store while I contacted police. Until that moment, I maintained composure, trying not to make it obvious that I felt extremely vulnerable. Here I was, at the mercy of three complete strangers, hoping the two I had in front of me were genuinely there to help. When the dispatch operator confirmed they had units on the way, I felt safe enough to end the call. I thanked the two men profusely and they walked out the door. After pausing for a moment, they turned around and came back inside. The younger one plainly stated, lock the door, he's coming this way. Then immediately ducks back out the door so I can lock myself in. As I flipped the deadbolt into position, I could see the dark figure moving toward the building at an intention pace, making it across the parking lot in about 10 strides. He tried opening the door but found it wouldn't budge. He asked the older man, where did the girl go? Who then tried to buy me some time by saying I was in the bathroom and I would be back in a minute. So this man, this possible assailant, walks around the corner towards the bathroom door and disappears behind the building. And of course we didn't have cameras outside to keep employees safe on the job, the only three working security feeds happened to all be trained exclusively on where the cashier would stand. It felt accusatory. It was at this point when real fear began to set in and I lost control of my composure. This unidentified man who had apparently been watching me for close to an hour was now laying in wait for me to exit the bathroom. I started to hyperventilate his thoughts of what his motivation could be. Had he been watching me before tonight? Was my store chosen at random or did this guy come here because he saw a small female at the register? Was he actually on drugs? Or was he just mentally unstable enough for it to appear that way? Did he have a weapon on him? Or did he plan to use his bare hands for whatever he was going to do? I peeked out the window and saw the two gentlemen exchanging glances and muted discussion of how to proceed from there. Thankfully, a local police SUV tore down the street and into the parking lot of the building next door, turning on his flashers and quickly coming to a stop. As soon as I was absolutely sure the man was gone, I sat on the curb outside sucking every last drop of nicotine out of my cigarette I held in a trembling hand. As if I telepathically summoned her, my phone rings with a call from my best friend. She said she was thinking about me and thought she would call to say what's up since she knew I would be bored. All I could respond with was, get here. Now. 20 minutes later all my roommates showed up in a pickup truck and stayed with me long enough to feel comfortable again. As anticlimactic as this ended, it could have definitely been a lot worse. I could have been robbed, or ped, or murdered. Or all three. All because I wasn't paying attention. I'll never know the true will of that dark figure under the streetlight, and maybe that's for the best. I don't think I could easily get past knowing what could have lied in store for me. And I wish I could have gotten one of the gentlemen's contact information so I could send a beef jerky bouquet or something manly that says, thank you. Living on New River Mountain in this county, I have been much wrought up by a phenomenon which has been witnessed there at intervals for several months but only recently assumed startling proportions. In May, reports were circulated of a mysterious rain of tiny stones, which apparently came out of nowhere. At first, these reports attracted little attention, but as time passed, they became general. In May, several stones fell in a clearing near the cabin of Cy Henley, who lives halfway up the north slope of the mountain. These were jagged pieces of sandstone the size of a walnut. I remember Henley cursing the person supposed to have thrown the stones. One night in June, I was wakened by sounds on the roof like the falling of hail. As I had a little garden patch, I was uneasy as to the effect of the hail. Examination in the morning developed that the hail was composed of tiny stones. I spoke of this to other mountaineers, and it was learned that stones had fallen at other points on the mountain. In July, a clearing almost on top of the mountain was visited by a desultory rain of stones, 
many of them striking buildings with loud noise and bounding off. A peculiarity of this shower was the presence of several pebbles, which are as rare on that mountain as icicles in August. The superstition of the mountaineers was aroused, and some strange theories were advanced. The reports grew as they went. A newspaper in a neighboring county recently printed a story that showers of stones were constant on the mountains, and that business was suspended on account of the excited condition of the populace. The fact is that the populace consists of not more than a dozen families scattered over the mountains, and there never was any business to suspend. The most peculiar manifestations occurred on the farm of Ellison Fosman, a justice of the peace living on the south slope. Several stones had fallen here at intervals of a day or so, and Ed Meekers, a school teacher of the vicinity, went to Fosman's to investigate. A stone was heard to fall in the yard, and after some search, we found it. It was almost sunk beneath the hard surface of the ground and was smooth, black, and of a perfectly oval shape, and about the size of a robin's egg. Meeker said it was warm when he touched it. Just as he stooped, another stone struck him with a sharp blow in the small of the back. This stone was scarcely larger than a lima bean and about the same shape, although not so regular. A stone about as large as a man's fist and resembling brown hematite iron or fell on the roof of Addison Butt's house, two miles from Fosman's, and, bounding off, fell into a barrel of water standing at the corner of the house. It sizzled like hot iron and sent up a little cloud of steam. This stone is undoubted of meteoric origin, as some of the others may be, but the average falling stone is an irregular, jagged bit of sandstone, and small clouds of coarse sand accompany some of the stones. Twigs are broken off trees, shingles split, and corn broken down. Probably a bushel of these stones have fallen, all in all, in the clearings. If, as seems probable, the phenomenon has been general over the mountain, several tons must have fallen. In the valley of New River Mountain, the wildest reports receive credence, and the Reverend John Justin, a local Baptist exhorter, is using them with startling effect at nightly revival meetings at the Little Log Schoolhouse. It was 1970 and my entire family was driving home from Arizona to Washington. My two brothers and older sister were asleep in the back seat of our scout. I was three sleeping on my mother's lap in the front seat. My dad always prefers the scenic route so we were driving through the painted desert Arizona. It was about an hour or so before dawn. My dad says it caught his eye on the right side of the road, just out of nowhere. One minute there was no light and the next it was there softly glowing. As they approached this light, they could see it was a man dressed in a bright, shiny metal suit. It reminded him of armor. He said he seemed to be almost seven feet tall. The figure stretched out its arm and motioned for them to come forward. He doesn't remember being afraid, just in awe. My mom confirms everything he said up to that point. They lost a couple of hours and don't remember driving out of there. My dad says he came to pump gas. It stayed with him all his life. He was a great artist and drew the scene hundreds of times over the years. This happened when I was younger, probably around eight, after I had experienced what I know now as a near-death experience. I was with my grandmother who was still very healthy for a 76-year-old woman. We went trekking across our rural property with a picnic basket in tow, just looking to sit down with our dog and have a nice time. Normal grandparent stuff. We ended up crossing the creek, it was dry at the time, to go to the back pasture. Nearby, probably 50 yards away, was our cedar tree. We sat down and started eating when our dog started acting crazy. This dog, bless her soul, was an angel. Did not act like a dog most of the time. She never barked, never jumped, and always acted politely. She went nuts, running in circles around us, growling and barking. My grandmother got concerned so she put our picnic stuff back in the basket and tried to calm her down. I was sitting a few feet away, scared because my dog was growling. 
I will admit my memory gets fuzzy around here, but I remember seeing a large gray creature step out of the creek slash tree line we had previously walked through. My grandma scooped me up and booked it out of there, our dog running with us. I am 90% sure she ran to the cedar tree. She always talks about it being her favorite tree, and about how protective it is. The tree was a lot closer than her house, which was roughly a half mile away at this point. I just know our dog calmed down and I was happier. No, I don't live in the southwest, I live in the south central slash eastern Arkansas, close to Louisiana. So, I have no idea what it could be. I was driving out in the country in a back road town of Willis, Michigan. Then something quite startling ran in front of my car. It literally was running so fast not only was it a two-footed seven to nine foot blur. It was weird how its legs literally went from the foot back to a joint. Like an ankle. Then forwards like a joint like our knee. Then it went back to the hip. It made it go so fast almost literally went in front of my back road cruising 25 to 35 miles per hour. I watched, but as fast as it was, I made its full body out. Its head had pointy like upward ears like a Doberman pincher almost. Then its body was like a person except the shoulders were strong like a very built man. Its head had remained to point straight ahead like our heads do. But its body was longer because of how tall it was. It has been running like a blurry werewolf. And since it was a full moon, I thought werewolf. But it was running so fast because it had a different shape than the people. I wish I could draw. I will never forget what it looked like. It went in front of my car running into a small back road cemetery. It had to have been a werewolf. I'm not sure what it really was but as soon as I saw it my first instinct was to pray and go to the nearest church as fast as possible. So I did. While saying the Lord's Prayer I trembled and my body was in fear of the unknown. I stayed at a church and slept in the parking lot the entire night. I thought that would be crazy if werewolves had been truly really actually physically real. But I went back later to find out the cemetery was called the Child's Cemetery and the name was from the child's family. Most of the tombs had been children of the Masonic Templars for the symbols all had distinct characteristic traits and the actual percentage of the graves had actually been from children. All had died between 1927 to 1932. I don't know what it was from. Smallpox maybe. But that was the first, but not the last, time. I was with this girl crazy. I thought she was for talking to herself. But we saw two of them running in a field a week later. I thought of shapeshifters and things of nature. I don't know what made it come to mind. But whatever the case it was scary. This just happened a few hours ago, I have called and reported it to the police and I am home safely but guess I am still in shock. Could do with putting it down and writing to process it and figured this is as good a place as any to share what happened. I finished work early today and so decided to go out for a run. I set out around 4.30 and decided my usual routes which cross many roads will not be very practical and so I took an alternate route along a canal towpath and some pathways through woods that I knew would be less busy. Everything was going well, I was pushing myself steady until I got to a pathway on the way back around 6 km into the route. It is a long straight path with a canal on the left side and on their right there is wasteland where some factories used to be but have mostly been demolished. It has been left abandoned for as long as I can remember and is overgrown with trees and weeds but there are the odd bits of an old factory that for some reason weren't fully demolished. As I got level with one part of the factory which still had some old metal fire escape steps attached to it I noticed a rough looking guy sat on the wall with his legs hanging down. He jumped to his feet as he saw me coming and shouted something but I couldn't make it out. As I came level to where he was I heard him say wait there, can you help me find my phone? He said this while he was running down the steps and so I stopped as I got level with where the bottom of the steps was meaning we were standing just a few feet apart but with a fence in between us. 
It was a really old iron fence with vertical metal bars that have spikes at the top like you sometimes see around churches and things. He asked me if I would help him find his phone again saying he had dropped it somewhere nearby and asked if I could ring his number so he could listen for it. I felt I couldn't exactly refuse as my phone was strapped to my arm so I said he could tell me the number and I took my phone off my arm and unlocked it. He blurted out a phone number but said it far too fast and it didn't begin with 07 which made me start to feel like something wasn't right. Although I was beginning to suspect at this point I wasn't really worried, I am in pretty good shape, had a big size and weight advantage over him plus there was a fence between us. He didn't seem in very good physical shape and seemed like he might be homeless, I figured if he was trying to mug me for my phone his only chance would be if he pulled a knife so I made sure to stay a good distance away from the fence and kept my eye on where his hands were. So I told him I didn't catch any of the numbers because he said it too quickly and he came out with another number this time it did have 07 at the beginning. I entered 7 numbers and then he started to look around and saying I can hear it come and help me look as he looked around at the ground. I was about to say that I hadn't even finished dialing when a much larger black guy appeared from behind a section of wall to my right, he was also really scruffy looking and from the look of his eyes, it seemed like he was on drugs. He came out saying he could hear the phone ringing over towards him and beckoned me to come through a gap in the fence and help look. The white guy then said it is ringing yeah? And I told him it was even though I still hadn't dialed the last digits and now I was sure they were trying to lure me to come over to that side of the fence. After two or three times of them both beckoning me to come and help, always insisting they could hear the ring I heard the black guy say he's not going to fall for it he said it in a hushed way as if he thought I wouldn't hear but with it being out in the middle of nowhere I could clearly understand what he said. The white guy then started acting quite aggressive and punched a tree telling me he needed the phone badly and how his whole life was on the phone telling me to come and help them look for it. While he was punching the tree and ranting the black guy had taken a few steps away to the right meaning I couldn't keep my eyes on both at the same time, it was after 5 pm by this point and had gotten dark all of a sudden which made the whole thing even more unsettling. I noticed there was a gap in the fence where some of the bars had been removed right where the black guy was heading and I decided at that point to get the hell out of there and made a run for it. Neither of them said anything as I ran away, which makes me sure that they had malicious intentions. If they genuinely lost their phone and needed help I would expect them to shout where are you going? Or something to try and get me to come back but they didn't shout anything. After sprinting for a good 20 to 30 seconds I turned to see if they were chasing me, they were both stood on the path around where the gap in the fence had been but were not chasing me, they were just standing there watching me run away. I continued running away but kept looking back every few seconds until I was out of sight, it was at this point I got off the canal path and onto the roads. The person I spoke to on the phone to report it took my details and the descriptions but seemed to think it wasn't anything worth worrying about but said it will be investigated. The whole incident has left me a bit unnerved and I am pretty sure I won't be jogging that route alone anytime soon. Sir, my name is Megan. I am forwarding a summary of an experience that I and a friend had in August 2010. My friend and associate Kira and I traveled from Columbus, Ohio to Ravenswood, West Virginia on business. While we were there, I wanted to make a side trip to Gallipolis, Ohio to visit relatives I had not seen for quite a while. After our meeting and presentation, we drove onto Ohio Route 7 and traveled south along the Ohio River towards Gallipolis. We had a nice, though brief, visit with my relatives. Around 6 p.m., we left their home and drove a few miles north on Red. 7 to check into a hotel near the local airport. Around 7.30 p.m., we decided to get dinner and found a quiet restaurant so we could eat and work. After we finished, Kira needed to go to the store and pick up a few items that she forgot to pack. We headed to a Walmart that was nearby the restaurant. After we finished shopping, We were walking to the car when I noticed a woman running through the parking lot. When she reached her car, she looked back in the direction of the store and then hurriedly got into the car. 
I quickly looked in the same direction and saw what looked like a large bird flying above the roof of the store. It was difficult to see but when it swooped down where the parking lot lights would shine off of it. It looked like it was either oily or had shiny leather-like skin. Whatever it was, it had a wide wing span. I would guess it reached 8 to 10 feet across. It circled above the store for about a minute then just disappeared. We were both somewhat shocked at what we witnessed but figured that it was just a huge bird. Since it was dark, I figured we had misjudged what it really was. We drove back to the hotel and decided to call it a night so we could get an early start on the drive home in the morning. I got ready for bed but thought I'd watch some television first. By this time it was around 10 pm or so. I must have dozed off fairly quickly because the next thing I remember is frantic knocking on my door. I stumbled out of bed and checked who it was. It was Kira and she was obviously upset. She rushed into my room and said it's here. What are you talking about? A little bit perturbed that she woke me up. She said that she was laying on the bed reading when she heard something in the hallway. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and listened to what she thought were scratching sounds. After a few minutes, the sound stopped, so she went back to bed. Not long after she lay down she heard more scratching sounds but, from outside her window. Again she got up and peeked through the curtains. This time, something looked back at her. Our rooms were on the second floor in the back section of the hotel and both looked out onto a small parking lot and a large field beyond that. She could see, what she described as, a bald ugly man with wings who was looking directly at her with large bulging eyes that lit up bright red. It was there for only a few seconds. It then spread its wings while running at the same time toward the end of the parking lot and lifted off the ground like a bird. You're kidding, right? I muttered to her. Meg, I swear to God, that thing is out there and it knows we saw it. I knew the only way I was going to get some sleep was to allow Kira to stay in my room. The next morning we woke early, checked out, and drove back to Columbus. Kira didn't mention the incident from the previous night during the ride. In fact, she has still never said anything else about it. We continue to be good friends and have a very good working relationship. But, I got curious. I had never heard about the Moth Man or any of the tales associated with it. I grew up in Texas and had only lived in Ohio for a few years. I moved into my mom's house after she had passed away. Her relatives lived throughout Ohio but I had never been told any of the stories. This is the reason I am writing to you. We were near Point Pleasant, West Virginia when we had this encounter. Do you think that it is possible that this was a Mothman? I read some of your posts recently and I'm starting to believe that Kira actually saw something supernatural. In light of the prophecies of danger that this thing is supposed to warn people about, Kira has had some bad luck and tragedy since that day. Her husband suddenly left her, she had a fire in her house and she severely injured her leg in a fall. Could this be connected? I personally don't believe in predictions, either good or bad. But I will admit that these have been strange times since we witnessed whatever. I have been visited by otherworldly beings since 1974. I've had missing time many times over the past 48 years, and have been abducted countless times. I did have one experience in 1999 that I had reoccurring dreams, a night that happened at my home in northern Wisconsin. I remember being taken from my bed, being led into my living room. I remember seeing things around me. I was shown a young girl 12 years old or so. I remember knowing that I was the child's father. I remember being so angry, that I was used over years to create this abomination. I had, for as long as I can remember, maybe 25 years, kept a gun in my bed, under my pillow. I had it in my hand. I remember being so angry that I was able to pull free, and I shot and killed the girl. I am a law enforcement officer. Since that day, I put it away, and I have trouble handling it. After shooting the girl, I remember being punished. I have had lumps in my arms that hurt and remain today. Each time that they come, they find different ways to make me suffer. 
All this time I hesitate to tell anyone else about any of my sightings, but I did report my story to MUFON. They called me and made me feel like a criminal. I have heard the story of the Quaker man who left Philadelphia to start a new life in the mountains of Pennsylvania. He was a man of strong faith, and after purchasing a large lot in Cook Township, he found employment at the Old South Mountain Iron Works. The land was perfect for him, with a stream full of brook trout, plentiful timber, and lots of open space to raise a family. He soon met a young woman and fell deeply in love with her. They were married by the local justice of the peace, despite the fact that she was not of the same religious faith as he was. However, they were happy together, and she soon became pregnant. In the final month of her pregnancy, the young wife began to experience bouts of anger and intense pain. The doctor could not diagnose the cause of her malady and ordered her to complete bed rest. The Quaker had a horrible dream that the devil had come to visit their home while he was at work. He was sure that his wife was possessed by a demonic being and that he needed to purge her of this evil. For ten days straight, he knelt by her bedside, invoking prayers and charms, much to the chagrin of his wife. However, his wife soon became disgusted by the fuss her husband was making. In a fit of rage, she grabbed a small wooden cross and flung it out of the window. She declared that there was no God and that the devil was only a creation of a feeble mind. That very night, the Quaker's wife went into labor. She told in agony for the entire night and into the early morning. A midwife was quickly summoned for the delivery. Soon after daybreak, the child started its way into the world. As the midwife coaxed the new mother to push, it soon became apparent that this child was unlike any she had ever witnessed. The newborn boy resembled a beast, not a human. It was alive and breathing but did not cry or make any sound. It was gray in color and had more scales than skin. It had a long tail and small horn buds above its pointed ears. There were claws for hands and hooves for feet. It also emitted a foul, lingering stench. This was the embodiment of Mephistopheles. The Quaker was horrified and could not believe that this was his child. He refused to even touch it. The midwife, who had seen many things in her time, was shocked and did not know what to do. The child lived for only a few minutes before passing away. The Quaker's wife died soon after giving birth. The Quaker was left alone with his thoughts and his beliefs. He eventually left the mountains and returned to Philadelphia, where he tried to reconcile his faith with the terrible thing that had happened to him. The story of the Quaker and his wife has been passed down through generations. Some say it was a curse, others say it was a punishment for the wife's blasphemy. But the truth remains a mystery, lost to time and to the mountains of Pennsylvania. Okay, this happened a couple of years ago, before we turned 18 and before uni started so we had a lot of spare time and nowhere to spend it so my friends and I would often just walk round our town at night talking about random stuff. On the night in question it was just me and one friend, and we were just walking without really paying attention to where we were going since we were in pretty deep conversation. We found ourselves walking towards an entrance to a footpath that's behind an estate. There's a fork in the path and going left will eventually take you to the high street and a train station, going right will take you to some fields behind a cemetery. We went right which sounds like a dumb idea but it made sense at the time because you could get into the cemetery through the fields and then onto the estate where we lived by coming out of the cemetery. Initially I didn't even want to go down the path in the first place, I'm scared of the dark and generally would rather not walk through a graveyard and a bunch of creepy forests slash paths at night. My friend reassured me though and after all it was the quickest way home. About 5 minutes in, the path leads through a small wooded area and after that there is the gate that opens into the cemetery. It's really dark in this part, except for some distant lights from houses allowing you to see a little bit in front of you. That's when we saw a figure in the distance walking towards us. From what I could make out it just looked like one guy, probably a similar age to us because teens would often use this path to get from one estate to the other. 
I quietly told my friend that and he agreed. We weren't worried because while there are some bad kids in our area, people don't really give you any trouble when they're on their own. As the person walked closer to us and us to them I realized it was not a teenager, but a really tall man. Trying to calm myself, I remembered a tall guy I see a lot walking his dog, a big Alsatian, yes it must be him. I scanned the area for his dog but I saw nothing, however the man was holding something long in his hand. I thought it was a lead for his dog but it wasn't flexible and in the dark and in my paranoid state I thought it looked like the handle of an axe, or a spade. My friend and I hadn't said a word since the man got close, but I just knew he was thinking the exact same thing as me. I didn't want the man to notice that I was staring at him so I just looked down and walked as fast as I could without running. Thankfully, the gate was right there and once we got into the cemetery we felt safe. Once we got out into the open we started talking about what we saw and my friend agreed it looked like an axe or really big stick and said I was expecting to get a blow to the head as soon as we got near him. I babbled a bit, sorry, but I certainly stay away from dark paths now. Hello all. I wanted to share these two stories I have from my childhood that have always stuck with me and still creep me out to this day. Story 1, this story is short but makes me feel uneasy, nonetheless. I was in kindergarten as Mrs. Quigley's class, I loved her, when she got a call from the office that someone was there to pick me up. I think this was before the time of like emergency contact forms with designated people to sign you out. Because this happened so long ago, I can't remember if there was a name given or not. But I do remember being five years old and not feeling right. I told Mrs. Quigley I didn't know that person and didn't want to go with them. She didn't make me and I rode the bus home as usual that day. I can't help but think that situation was something bad because I don't remember it ever being a problem that I didn't get picked up that day, like it wasn't planned and it wasn't inconvenient that I didn't go with them. Story 2, my cousin and I were playing outside in a wooded area near her house and this wooded area was also next to a road. I just remember we were playing in there then this pickup truck stopped on the road next to us. I don't remember what he said, I just remember taking off and my cousin tripping over a branch and falling. I was too scared to help her. Back when I was younger, Around 12 to 13, my three friends and I, also the same age, had a fort right at the tree line by some woods near our neighborhood. Right next to the tree line was a series of fields used for sports, so technically our fort was on that property and not the woods. Separating the woods from the fields was a large chain-link fence. One day after a large storm, one of the trees from our fort was knocked over, leaning against the fence, naturally as kids, We thought that was awesome, except for ruining part of the fort. We all climbed up on the tree, sat on it and whatnot. After some time we were just sitting there having a conversation when I noticed one of my friends who was not on the tree was looking kind of past us, on the other side of the fence, a guys he said in a shaky tone. We all turn around and on the other side of the fence about 20 feet away was an old man, he was dressed in tattered clothes, including a newsboy hat. He looked to be in his mid-fifties to sixties. He stood there smiling at us, I definitely sensed some malicious intent with him. Which is creepy in itself but the part that gets me the most was how long he must have been there watching us, easily fifteen to twenty minutes before my friend noticed. In what seemed like forever, none of us spoke and all we could do was stare back at him. My adrenaline kicked in and my reaction was to just run away, where my friends also followed. After a few minutes or so we gained the courage to go back and when we did he was gone. It kind of scared us and we really never went back to that fort, now the fence is replaced and the fort is gone but my friends and I will never forget that creepy man. I've been a police officer in Salem City for over 10 years now, and I've heard all sorts of strange stories from the locals. But one particular report still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. It happened in the early spring of 1992, 
and it concerned a man named Dan and his girlfriend who were driving down Vitey Springs Road at around 10 p.m. Dan and his girlfriend were heading southwest of Salem when they saw something that they couldn't believe. A Bigfoot was standing in the middle of the road, holding a large plastic garbage bag. The creature seemed just as startled as they were and dropped the bag before running off into the darkness. Curiosity getting the better of them. The couple checked the bag and found it filled with old coffee cups. They immediately reported the sighting to the police, and the cups were turned over as evidence. The witness kept some of the cups as a gag, but the rest were handed over to the museum for further study. The witness described the creature as black, standing on two legs, with ape-like features and no neck. It looked surprised when it saw them and then squawked before running away. It was a chilling experience and I couldn't help but wonder what other strange creatures might be lurking in the shadows of our city. I decided to check the area around where the sighting happened, and I talked to a bookkeeper at a nearby furniture store. The bookkeeper had 20 acres of land nearby and had never experienced any problems or heard anything unusual in the past. However, he did mention that he heard strange howling sounds the year before. The encounter with the Bigfoot may seem like a wild story, but I believe the couple's account. There are still so many mysteries in this world, and we have yet to uncover all of them. As for me, I will continue to keep an open mind and investigate any reports that come my way, no matter how strange they may seem. I am Red Hawk, a proud warrior of Apache tribe. I have always defended my people and our land, and now, Faced with a threat like none we have ever known, I must do so once again. The signs were all there, the mangled carcasses of animals littering our once peaceful hunting grounds. No ordinary beast could have done this, and our elders whispered of an ancient legend, a creature that had not been seen for generations. As the tribe's most skilled hunter and fighter, it was my duty to find this monster and put an end to its reign of terror. I ventured deep into the forest, following the trail of destruction left by the unknown cryptid. The tracks were enormous, unlike anything I had ever seen. Fear gripped my heart, but I knew I had to be brave for the sake of my people. I continued my pursuit, fueled by determination and the hope that I could save my tribe from this horrifying menace. After days of tracking the creature, I finally caught sight of it. The beast was massive, with fearsome claws and teeth that could tear through flesh and bone with ease. Its eyes burned with an eerie, unnatural light. It was clear that this was no ordinary animal, but a monster born of darkness and nightmare. We engaged in a fierce battle, our deadly dance taking us through the forest and across treacherous ravines. Despite my best efforts, the creature's strength and speed were unparalleled. It inflicted terrible wounds upon me, but I fought on refusing to give in. I knew that the fate of my tribe rested on my shoulders. As our struggle continued, I realized that I would not be able to defeat the creature through brute force alone. In a final, desperate act, I decided to lower it towards a steep cliff, knowing that the fall would either kill or gravely injure the cryptid. With my last remaining strength, I charged at the monster, pushing us both over the edge. We plummeted towards the ground, the creature's terrible cries echoing through the air. As we hit the earth, I felt my own bones shatter, my lifeblood seeping into the soil. The cryptid lay nearby, crippled and defeated, its furious eyes now dimmed with pain and fear. As I lay dying, I knew that I had fulfilled my duty as a warrior. I had protected my people and driven the creature away, even at the cost of my own life. The legend of Red Hawk would live on and my tribe would be safe, their future secured by the sacrifice I had made. My vision began to fade, the shadows of the forest closing in around me. I smiled, knowing that I had not failed my people. I had faced the unknown and emerged victorious, and now, I could finally find peace. I have been a park ranger in a national park located in England for just over 10 years. I'm not going to reveal which one or even the county for the sake of my job, as I still work here. 
but there are some pretty weird things that you find every so often while on shift. Things that my superiors would likely not appreciate me sharing online. My job mainly involves patrolling the trails and checking that they're all in a safe state for people to walk through. I was also asked to talk with school children in assemblies and such after about a year or so on the job to express how important it is to stay with the group on the trails. I gave pretty obvious reasons for this, but little did I know I would soon discover some of the horrifying truths as to why they should never wander off. The first story I'm going to share with you took place on a beautiful spring morning in June, I think this was during my first year on the job. The sun was still low in the sky, but it was slowly rising and brightening my surroundings. I was on a normal morning patrol through one of the deeper trails as it hadn't been checked recently and protocol to frequently check all the trails for fallen trees and any potential natural hazards to hikers. It was such a beautiful morning, I remember walking along with a slight smile on my face as I listened to nature waking up in the trees. I found the cool breeze very relaxing, and it had a truly peaceful effect on my mood. Suddenly, the trees to my left were filled with the sounds of birds squawking loudly as they frantically flew away. I stopped and listened for just a moment, silence. A quote from another story I have read here reads very true to this situation, prey is silent when predators are near. Now, understand that we don't have any bears or wolves here in England, nothing like that. So, I suppose it could be a deer that had snapped a twig. However, the noise wouldn't usually drop like that as deer don't pose much of a threat to wildlife at all. I continued on not thinking anything of it, and after a short time, I got the urge to check behind me. There was a man walking maybe 100 meters back, and I was on a long straight, so it was easy to tell. I was confused as the trails aren't usually used until a little later when early dog walkers would show up, and even then, few would wander this far into the woods at this time. He seemed to be walking at a very relaxed pace, his hands in his dark blue hoodies pockets, and he had faded blue jeans. I radioed over to ask if anyone had seen someone enter the trail I was walking shortly after I left, but no one had seen anyone come in or out other than the occasional dog walker. I thought nothing of it but continued on a slightly hurried pace. I usually wouldn't be bothered about it, being out on my own with another stranger. I wasn't a small bloke nor someone to get spooked easily. However, this guy just gave me a bad feeling. I was approaching a gate that leads to a much denser area of the woodland, more like a thick forest. And as I closed the gate behind me, I noticed this man had stopped dead in his tracks. He seemed to be staring right at me, but I couldn't be sure. Then he broke into a sprint, not a light jog that somebody out for exercise might. I'm talking a full-on sprint. It was almost aggressive. I freaked out and turned to run. Why would a complete stranger who was previously so calm and relaxed suddenly be sprinting at me? He hadn't called for help or even waved to me. Fortunately, the trail's long straight section was over and I ran around a curve and hid behind one of the many large rocks that were by the side of the trail. I could hear his heavy footsteps thudding towards me right until he was just on the other side of the rock, and he stopped again dead in his tracks. He wasn't even out of breath. He just seemed to stand there for a while and then just walked off. I waited for what must have been close to 10 minutes to be sure he was far ahead and radioed the strange encounter to my colleagues who agreed it was strange. I cautiously continued on with my patrol. I never saw that strange man again, and I hope I never do. I have many more memories I would like to share with you. Stay safe out there, you are rarely truly alone in the forest. I've never been one to believe in things like Bigfoot or other mysterious creatures lurking in the woods. That is, until I heard the story from my friend's encounter with Littlefoot. It was the fall of 1992 and my friend was out fishing on the Sandy River, not far from where he lived off Coleman Road. He was kneeling on a rocky sandbar, tinkering with his fishing gear when he heard a noise in the trees just a few feet away. When he looked up, he was met with the sight of a short, hairy creature staring back at him. It was only about three and a half feet tall, 
covered in black-brown shaggy fur with red eyes that seemed to bore right into his soul. My friend froze, unsure of what to do, but then the creature growled at him and he knew it was time to run. He took off as fast as he could, never looking back. When he was at a safe distance, he turned back to see if the creature was following him, but it was gone. He made his way back home as quickly as he could and told me and some of our other friends about what he had seen. Of course, we didn't believe him at first, but the evidence he found at the scene was hard to ignore. When he was fishing, he found the remains of a fish, most likely a steelhead, that had been picked clean, with only the skeleton and head remaining on a rock. He also found the remains of a mallard duck, with all its feathers neatly picked off and the head bitten off, also on a nearby rock. It was all just too strange to be a coincidence. We didn't know what to make of it but we couldn't deny that something unusual had happened to our friend that day. From that point on, we all became a little more cautious when spending time in the woods. We never knew what might be out there, watching us from the shadows. Around 5.30 am, I received a call about a hulking figure seen lurking about near the intersection of US 2 and 41. I arrived at the scene to discover that a female motorist had witnessed the creature crossing in front of her vehicle as she traveled along US 2 into town. Additionally, I talked with two hunters who had also seen the same creature. The first hunter stated that he was nearly run off the road by it, while the other told me directly that he had encountered it firsthand. The witnesses are all experienced hunters familiar with what they should be seeing out there in order to safely navigate their way through these woods all during deer season. One witness specifically said that he has never seen anything like this before, but it definitely was not human. It was massive, black, or really dark brown. I could not tell what direction it was headed, it all happened so fast. I described the area near where I made contact with the witness as being very wet and overgrown with lots of thick underbrush. I also said that it's known to be an area where hunters have complained about encountering strange phenomena while out in the woods during hunting season. I stated that normally when I receive calls like this, they come from local townspeople who are also unfamiliar with the territory and making them easily identifiable and spotted by officers on patrol. I went on to say that these two specific eyewitnesses were definitely not locals, having spent most of their lives living in part of the Upper Peninsula. I said that my well over a decade of patrolling the area, I've never had to respond to something like this before, although it's no doubt harvested my interest in researching and hunting these reported creatures. My name is Akita, and I am the Shaman of Chickasaw Tribe. For weeks now, I have been tormented by prophetic dreams, Visions of a monstrous creature that brings death and destruction to my people. I knew I had to act, or the nightmare would become a reality. With my tribe's blessing, I embarked on a perilous journey to confront the beast and save my people. The creature was a shapeshifter, a malevolent spirit that could assume the forms of various animals, making it nearly impossible to predict its movements. I knew that my spiritual powers and knowledge of nature would be crucial in this battle. I traveled deep into the wilderness, following the trail of devastation left by the creature. Days turned into weeks as I tracked the shapeshifter, witnessing the carnage it left in its wake. I knew that time was running out, and I needed to act quickly if I wanted to save my tribe. One night, as I rested under the stars, I received a vision. I saw a clearing in the forest where I would confront the beast. With renewed determination, I followed my vision, and soon found myself standing in the heart of the clearing. As I prepared for battle, the creature revealed itself. It was a monstrous, ever-changing mass of fur and scales, a horrifying amalgamation of the animals it had consumed. It snarled, and I felt the weight of its malevolent presence bearing down on me. Drawing upon the spirits of the earth and the wisdom of my ancestors, I used my powers to weaken the creature. I called upon the forces of nature to bind and immobilize it, trapping it within a circle of living vines. But the shapeshifter was more powerful than I had imagined. 
It struggled and roared, tearing through the vines and lunging toward me. As it charged, I desperately called upon the spirits once more, but it was too late. The shapeshifter overpowered me, sinking its teeth into my flesh. I fell to the ground, my strength fading, as I watched the creature turn and race toward my tribe. In my final moments, I realized that the prophecy could not be averted. The nightmare I had fought so hard to prevent was unfolding before my very eyes. As darkness consumed me, I prayed for the souls of my people, and hoped that one day, another would rise to avenge us and put an end to the shapeshifter's reign of terror. My cousin and I were on a camping trip to the Bohemia Mine area like we do at least two times a year. This was in 1992 or 1993 I'd be live in August. We set up camp and then hiked around until evening then came back and made dinner. After dinner it was dark so we went up to Lookout Tower which besides Bohemia Mountain itself was the highest peak about 6,000 feet. There was a meteor shower that weekend and we went up to watch it. We stayed up there till about 21 I think and then went back to our camp. We stayed up for about half of an hour then went to bed. We had a three-man tent to sleep in. At about 22-23 I was just about to fall asleep when I started hearing branches breaking like something walking through the woods towards us. It started a ways away from our camp and kept getting closer. My cousin was calling my name and asking me if I had heard the sounds but I was concentrating on listening to them and too scared to answer him so I just lay there like I was asleep. We had taken his car up there and we parked it about 100 feet away from our tent because there was too many branches and stuff to drive it all the way up to the tent. The noises stopped and all of a sudden there was high pitched and fast whoop, whoop, whoop that from about where his car was parked. My cousin asked what that noise was and said nothing because it scared me to death. Then it started walking our way and we just laid there and listened and it got closer and closer to our tent until it came about a couple of feet. Away. We were so scared we laid there and didn't move a muscle because whatever it was had been walking on two feet not four. It stopped making noise a couple of feet away and we couldn't hear any walking until we could hear it was right next to he tent it had snuck up real quiet we could hear it breathing. When my cousin moved a leg it scared whatever was outside our tent and it took off running and we could hear the individual steps that hit the ground like thunder. It sounded very heavy. It ran off about 50 feet and stopped. Then it would start walking back towards us, got within about 10 feet. Then we couldn't hear it anymore. Then all of a sudden it was right next to the tent. It had snuck up real quiet again to our tent. It could move very quiet when it chose to. It moved from one side of the tent to the other quietly and fast. It would be on one side and then the other before we knew it. It did this pretty much all night. It had left once then came back. Finally we fell asleep off and on. In the morning we looked for tracks but there was too much forest litter to see any. We did not have any protection with us at the time and I have never been so scared in my life. I have believed in Sasquatch pretty much all my life. My cousin and I go up there a couple of times a year to look for evidence and hope to have another encounter, but if not, I have hunted since I was a little boy with my father and continue to hunt today and I know the sounds deer, elk and other four-legged creatures make when walking and this creature defiantly was walking on two legs. Deer usually visit our camp when we go up there and we can hear them coming in the dark, they get close and we can see them in the flashlight. I have read other accounts in books after hours and have found a few simulaities, like the heavy footsteps when it ran, the whoop, whoop, whoop we heard is also in Roosevelt's account I believe as well as others. My cousin and I have read books about the 40s and some of the miners reported seeing Bigfoot, there is also other reports from the Cottage Grove area that I have from old newspapers. I have became a volunteer researcher and have read a lot of reports and my cousin and I have gone over this in our heads to make sure that it couldn't have been another animal that visited us and we know that it was a Sasquatch. I grew up in a small town near Wallawa Lake in Oregon, and I've always been fascinated by the stories of the Wallawa Lake Monster, or Wally, as some locals call it. 
My grandfather used to tell me tales about the creature when I was a child, and I was always on the lookout for any signs of its existence whenever I visited the lake. One summer, when I was in my early 20s, I decided to go camping at Wallawa Lake with a group of friends. We had a great time hiking, swimming, and exploring the area, but I couldn't shake my fascination with the Wallawa Lake monster. I asked some of the locals if they had ever seen it, but most of them just shrugged it off as a silly legend. One night, while we were sitting around the campfire, one of my friends told a story about a fisherman who had claimed to have seen the Wallawa Lake monster while out on his boat. He described it as a hump-shaped creature, about 20 feet long, with rough, scaly skin and glowing red eyes. The fisherman had been so terrified that he never went back to the lake again. As we all sat around the fire, listening to the story, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. What if the Wallawa Lake monster was real? What if it was watching us right now? The next day, I decided to rent a kayak and go out on the lake to see if I could spot anything unusual. As I paddled around the calm waters, I felt a sense of excitement and fear. What if I actually saw the monster? But as the sun began to set and I still hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary, I began to feel disappointed. Maybe the Wallawa Lake monster was just a myth after all. Just as I was about to head back to shore, I heard a strange sound coming from the water behind me. It was a deep, guttural growl, unlike anything I had ever heard before. My heart raced as I turned my kayak around, and I couldn't believe what I saw. There, just a few feet away from me, was a hump-shaped creature with rough, scaly skin and glowing red eyes. It was easily 20 feet long, and it looked just like the descriptions I had heard all my life. I was paralyzed with fear, but the creature didn't seem interested in me. It swam away quickly, disappearing into the depths of the lake. As I paddled back to shore, my mind was racing. I had finally seen the Wallawa Lake monster, and I couldn't believe it. But now that I had seen it with my own eyes, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the lake was hiding. I remember the night my colleagues told me about their encounter with the strange creature in the suburbs of Minneapolis. It was roughly 1 AM, in the middle of the night, and they were driving along the side of the road. The environment was dark and the lights were flickering, creating an eerie atmosphere. According to them, they saw a tall figure, almost 10 feet in height, standing on the side of the road. It was white slash grayish in color and had no identifiable facial features. The creature was skinny and had no hair, clothes, or genitalia. Despite its humanoid shape, it was unlike anything they had ever seen before. My colleagues were not superstitious and did not believe in ghosts. They were rational people who had never reported anything like this before. However, they were both adamant about what they saw and their stories matched up perfectly they saw the same thing. To this day, they never saw the creature again. It remains a mystery, a strange and unexplained encounter that will forever be etched in their memories. I couldn't help but feel a chill run down my spine as they told me their story. The thought of encountering such a creature in the dead of night is enough to make anyone feel uneasy. I had been a police officer for 10 years and had seen my fair share of strange things. But nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered at Graceland Cemetery. It was a quiet night, just past midnight, when the call came in. There had been reports of strange activity at the cemetery, and I was the closest officer on duty. As I made my way through the winding roads leading to the cemetery, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. When I arrived, I saw that the gate was wide open. It was strange since the cemetery was supposed to be closed for the night. I walked cautiously into the cemetery, my flashlight guiding my way. As I approached a particular gravestone, I saw a figure standing near it. At first, I thought it was just a person paying their respects to the deceased, but as I got closer, I realized that this was no ordinary person. It was a tall figure with a pale complexion and piercing red eyes. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. 
I tried to call out to it, but it just stood there, staring at me. Suddenly, the figure started to move towards me. I tried to back away, but I was rooted to the spot. It was then that I realized that I was facing something beyond my understanding. It was like the creature was toying with me, playing with my mind. I don't remember how long I stood there, frozen in fear. But the next thing I knew, the creature was gone, vanished into the night. I was left alone with my thoughts, trying to make sense of what I had just experienced. In the days that followed, Mineral Point was gripped by a strange epidemic of mass hysteria. People reported seeing the same creature I had encountered in the cemetery. It was like a vampire had descended upon our quiet town, and there was no escaping its grasp. Over the years, there were sudden outbreaks and bizarre crimes that were attributed to the Mineral Point vampire. But despite all efforts to catch the creature, it remained elusive, always lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim. Now, years later, I still can't shake off the memory of that fateful night. The Mineral Point vampire may be gone, but the fear it instilled in me remains. Every time I pass by Graceland Cemetery, I can't help but wonder if the creature is still out there, waiting for its next victim. Okay, I will first start this with saying I've never believed in the mythical creature crap but after what I saw I kinda have changed my mind. I was walking in the woods behind my house last Monday, I was on a dirt road and all of a sudden I heard a very 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 loud thump on the ground, like if a 20,000 pound bull could run, and I kinda ran to try to get a glimpse of it, thinking it was a deer, I saw a person-like figure, very very dark, it could have been dark because of shadows or what not, the time was 5 in the afternoon by the way, broad daylight. Anyway, it was kinda skinny but not really, it looked like it had horns but I couldn't really tell because I only saw it for a split second before it absolutely bolted off, and any time I go in the woods I carry a gun, I decided to carry a shotgun today, Seeing what I thought was some meth head or mythical creature I pulled my shotgun off of my back and kept walking a little down the road and I immediately called my friend and told him what happened. I wasn't worried in the moment considering I had a gun because nothing is bulletproof and I kept walking and I got a feeling to just turn around. So that's what I did. After processing what I saw, the whole way home I was looking behind my shoulder, I would take about two steps and look behind me. But whatever I saw it didn't make any noises, it just ran off, it didn't trot off like a deer, it ran like a person. I told my brother today about it and he told me that within the year he was outside at night with our dad just in my driveway and he saw something hunched over, no hair, pointy ears and grayish in color run past, probably about 30 miles per hour, from a corner of the house to a car parked right next to it, this was about 10 feet away from him by the way and he at first thought it was a person and he went and looked behind the car and there wasn't anything there, he also looked under and didn't see anything, he said it was absolutely quiet as well, he asked our dad if he heard or saw anything and he said no, so he didn't know what he saw. The thing my brother described didn't sound like what I saw but I believe him, I wonder how long this creature or creatures have been out there. I'm very creeped out though and I really don't want to go back out there anyway. I'm not asking you to believe me because just a week ago if I read this I would say this is fake us, but not any damn more, I'm just asking for some help to understand what I saw. I couldn't believe my ears when I heard about the discovery of a goblin fetus in Mexico. The news had spread like wildfire on the internet, with people from all over the world debating the identity of the freaky find. As a journalist, I couldn't resist the urge to investigate. I traveled to Santa Maria Regla, where the alleged orkling was found, to get to the bottom of the mystery. The mummified corpse was reportedly unearthed during construction work on a derelict warehouse. The photos I saw showed a small body with pointy ears, a large nose, gnarled claw-tipped hands and feet, and no identifiable gender. It looked like something straight out of Lord of the Rings. The municipal mayor in town, Francisco Mayoral Flores, quickly labeled the remains a goblin or a nagual, 
a Mesoamerican mythical creature that can transform into an animal. He believed that the discovery was relevant due to the cultural and social demand to give it importance. However, not everyone was convinced by Flora's explanation. Social media was abuzz with skepticism, with some people suggesting that it was a malformed fetus of a cat or dog. Doctors and vets were even called in to confirm the identity of the creature. As I visited the Museo de los Duendes, also known as the Goblin Museum, where the goblin baby was currently on display, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The small, mummified body looked eerie and out of place in the glass case. Despite the controversy surrounding the discovery, it was clear that the people in Santa Maria Regla took their mythology seriously. As I left the museum, I wondered if there was more to this story than just a simple case of mistaken identity. Friday night I was near Blue River in Colorado. We couldn't make it to the actual campsite so we car camped for the night. Got a fire going and watched the full moon slowly peek up over the mountains. After a couple hours, we heard something that I thought was an elk bugle at first. But elk don't typically bugle at night, not that I've heard of at least. Then it started changing tones and went to a higher pitch. It changed tones and pitch a few different times. It wasn't screaming or anything like that, but it was eerie. It was going on for a solid minute before anyone said anything. At which point we were all weirded out because we've never heard anything like that. I've listened to every animal I could think of in the area, from mountain lions to owls, and nothing matches the sound we heard. One of my friends described it almost like a siren song. Does anyone have any ideas on what it could be? I never thought I would see anything like it. It was just another day driving home from work with my two buddies Seamus and Sterling. We had just finished work and were driving down the road when we saw it, under the streetlight. We couldn't quite make out what it was at first, but as we got closer, we realized it was no ordinary animal. Seamus shouted, guys, look at that. And that's when we all saw it. The figure was slouched over and had very long arms, it had an ape-like face, and it was huge. We had never seen anything like it before. At first, we thought it was a really big animal, but it didn't run like one. It ran in a very ape-like way. As soon as it noticed us, it turned in our direction. We were terrified. We had heard of the legendary Yaoi, but we never thought we would come face to face with one. Sterling said we were in utter disbelief of what we were seeing. It didn't make sense to us, and we were all confused and scared. After the encounter, we couldn't stop talking about what we saw. We went on a few hikes to see if we could find anything, but we didn't have any luck. We even talked to the locals, and they told us they had seen evidence of the Yowie before. I never believed in anything like this before, but after that experience, I know there's something out there. Something big and scary. I hardly slept that night, and I felt overwhelmed that I had seen something that I never believed in previously. It's an experience that will stay with me forever. I have always been fascinated by tales of creatures that lurk in the depths of the ocean or rivers. So when I came across a story about a cryptid from Greenland, I was immediately intrigued. The creature was described as a large rodent-like creature, similar in form to a rat or mouse, but with a long and sharp tail made of steel or iron. According to the legend, the creature would swim underwater, sneaking up on boats and ships and using its sharp tail to poke holes in them, causing them to sink. Once the ships were submerged, the creature would feast on the humans aboard. As terrifying as the tale was, it only became more frightening when I learned that it was often told to children to scare them into staying inside at night. The thought of this creature lurking beneath the waves, waiting to attack unsuspecting victims, sent shivers down my spine. But the story didn't end there. There was also a tale of a little girl and her father who were leaving Greenland on separate ships, as the ships separated passengers by sex. The little girl arrived safely on land, 
but soon heard the terrible news that her father's ship had been sunk by the cryptid. As I delved deeper into the story, I found myself becoming more and more obsessed with this mysterious creature. I scoured the internet for any information I could find, but to no avail. It was as if the creature had vanished into thin air. Despite my frustration, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story than what was being told. Perhaps there were others who had encountered the creature and had their own tales to share. And maybe, just maybe, I could be the one to uncover the truth about this elusive cryptid. So I live in a town in the Blue Mountains Australia a place known for Yowie and Panther sightings, and I have heard strange calls coming from the nearby bush before. So a few months ago I was riding my bike on some old fire trails and I just felt really strange all of a sudden but I kept going. So first I went by a sewage treatment facility and felt really of like something was watching me. Then I went down a hill and decided to go down to some nearby waterfalls. As I was going down to the falls I again felt really of and worried I then saw the guys walking by and I stopped and looked around and felt this overwhelming dread come over me so I decided to book it back up the hill and I could hear cracking from the bush and I kept looking behind me but there was nothing there. I've heard of drug addicts that live down in that area of town but they usually camp deep in the bush and don't really come out. I've also heard of a Yowie that lives in the area called Fat Foot but as far as I know no one has seen him in years. Since then I haven't really been down those fire trails but there was another one where I also felt off. Anyone know what it could be? Here is one of the creepiest encounters I've ever, which took place in the spring of 2015. It's important to the story to know that I was basically a huge jerk leading up to what happened. See, I'm a graduate student and I was at this point about 6 to 8 months into a new relationship with a woman named Sarah. If it matters, I am female and we were both around 30 at this time, the prior year, before I met Sarah, my best bud from school Josh and I had gone on a great camping slash road trip over spring break. This year, I messed up and basically double booked myself to go camping with Josh and with my GF, because I am a scatterbrained idiot and I got confused about what plans have been discussed slash solidified. Both Josh and Sarah were justifiably really pissed off and hurt, but I had made the plan with my girlfriend first, ultimately, so I had to flake on Joshua when it came time to planning. Sarah and I picked a campground in southwestern Pennsylvania with lots of good hiking. It's at least a 5 hour drive from where we live. We made reservations and I mentioned the plan to Joshua well, it turns out, of all the campgrounds in the region, Josh had also decided to head to that one as it connected to a long bike trail he wanted to go on. He had decided to go camping alone, so we knew Josh would be at the campground before we got there, but things were super awkward between me and him on account of my being an asshole and him being generally a bit depressed around that time. We stayed three nights and Josh was there for the first and second night. We'd rented out a small cabin, basically a prefab shed with bunk beds, because it was cheap and we have a leash reactive, wimpy about rain dog and it's sometimes easier that way. Josh was tent camping in another spot. I think Josh and I were mostly planning on avoiding each other, he was rightfully still angry, things were awkward and I figured he needed some space from me, but it turned out only one bathroom was open on our side of the campground, since it was only early April and most of the campground was still closed down for the season. Josh's campsite was right next to the open bathroom, so we ended up seeing him when we walked to the bathroom at night. I saw heard signs of one or two other groups on the far side of the campground but they had their own bathroom open over there and we never really saw them. It's a very large and forested campground and only small sections at either end were open for the season. The second night, Josh was out on his campsite when we came through to the bathroom before bed. It was after midnight at this point. Josh seemed super depressed and we had a very strange and awkward conversation with him, took care of what we needed to in the bathroom and headed back to our little shed, down the road. The roads in this part of the campground were basically like an inverted F, with the bathroom above the top of the F. 
In between the two arms of the F was a stand of trees next to the main road, a small, locked shower building and Josh's campsite, furthest from the main road, the main road being the vertical line of the F. We were staying off the main road further down on the opposite side. So that night we'd cut past Josh's camp to get to the bathroom but on the way back, we followed the road, so as not to bother him, as he seemed in a bad mood. It was dark and I'm easily spooked. We had the dog with us, which was somewhat reassuring, since he looks semi-tough, despite being a nutcase and a wimp. But I'm looking around nervously, and as I glance over my shoulder, I think I see a man off to the side of us. My brain processes this very slowly, as I just caught a glimpse of him as I turned my head, and it was very dark. I convinced myself my mind was playing tricks. I didn't look back and silently walked with Sarah and the dog back to our cabin. When we got back to the cabin, I thought Sarah looked a little spooked, which is unusual, since she's a lot braver than me. Eventually she says, that guy was really creepy, right? So shit. He was real. I told her I saw him but had convinced myself my eyes were playing tricks on me. But no. We both saw someone with no flashlight standing in the trees just off the road, maybe 15 feet from us. I asked if it might have been Joshua neither of us were really convinced, but wanted to convince ourselves so we could get some sleep. And he had been wandering around being moody 15 minutes before, and it was right by his campsite. I think we didn't want to freak ourselves out any further, so we locked the cabin and didn't talk about it much more. The next morning it was pouring rain so Josh decided to pack up and leave early instead of spending the day in the area. We shouted goodbye to him as we headed to the bathroom and he ran around tossing shit in his trunk and trying not to get drenched. That night was a weekend and there was a big family in the cabin next to ours and everything felt far less spooky. But when we got back to town a day later, I texted Josh, asking him if he'd been lurking creepily in the woods. He said no. Well, I told him what we'd seen and he said he'd seen a guy the prior night lurking in the woods without a flashlight. Same general description, which I'll get to, same area. The guy had really creeped him out, so much so that the next day he bought the biggest maglight he could find, so he'd have more than just a pocket knife to defend himself. But he'd also mostly convinced himself it was a park ranger. Yeah, with no flashlight, let alone a vehicle but he more or less willed himself to believe it so he could get some sleep. So, once we could no longer pretend it was Josh, Sarah and I compared notes. What we both saw, and what Josh saw the night before, was this, a tall, gaunt white man in his late 40s, with clean-shaven sunken cheeks, in the stand of trees slash bramble just off the road, in the space between the arms of the F. He was wearing a raincoat, rubber boots and a hat, and had no flashlight. He was just standing still and staring coldly in our direction. I remember his raincoat, his sunken face and how very cold his gaze felt. In contrast, Josh is several inches shorter than whoever we saw, was not wearing a raincoat that night, which we knew because we'd just seen him, but we convinced ourselves otherwise bearded, 29 years old at the time, I should add, it wasn't raining. To be clear, where this guy was was not somewhere you'd be strolling through, it was a thick brambly area. He had made the effort to move out of the road and to stay in the shadows and away from the bright bathroom light, both nights. We're sure he wasn't going to the bathroom, though we were on the women's side, you can hear the men's side clearly and Josh had been outside in view of the bathroom doors both nights. He didn't look like he lived in the woods, which is to say, he appeared clean and groomed, and his clothes weren't worn or dirty. Whatever he may have been doing in the middle of the night in a nearly abandoned campground with no flashlight, he was clearly making an effort not to be seen. We all discussed it and Josh ultimately called the campground to let them know. They said they'd check it out. Although my camping fees were mysteriously refunded, we never heard anything more. Josh is still a little mad at me for seeing a potential murderer lurking the woods near his tent and not doing anything. Out of curiosity, we just checked to see if anything had happened in the park. A number of people have gone missing in the state park over the years, some slightly mysteriously. 
Most were found down river and believed to have fallen into the rapids on accident. I'm sure it's unrelated, but the whole place gives me the creeps. And I still can't figure out what that man was doing. So last year around November September I was driving home late at night, 2 or 3 am, from my buddy who lived on the other side of the city, with my bike. I was stoned as f when I was leaving, me and my buddy smoked a lot that evening. I had two routes in my head that time that get me home. One was 13 kilometers long trough a forest. The other was a much longer route trough the city around the forest. For info I live in Hanover, Germany the city is pretty much built around these big forests. I decided to go for the forest route which was already a bad choice since I didn't have any lights on my mountain bike and the forest is very dark at night. But I've been driving this route often since the other route is just waste of time. Was an easy decision for me back then since I'm a 2 meters tall male and was armed with a knife. So I'm rolling into the forest and my route trough it was this asphalted track for inline skaters and bikers. It goes all the way trough. I'm pulling out my cell phone to activate the camera light since this was my only light source. I hadn't realized I forgot to charge the phone at my buddy's house. So my phone has this option when it's below 5% battery level you can only activate the camera light for a few seconds. Till it turns off automatically and you need to turn it on again. Needless to say it was quite stressful to drive like that. Always the light turning on and off. It rained that night too but not much, more like foggy fine rain. I don't know what it's called in English but we call it in German Niesel. Cause of that I only could see what was close in front of me like 10 or 15 meters view only. 3-4 kilometers in, the track takes a sharp curve. After I was taking it I would see a white figure standing next to the road. It was dark as f late and him literally in the middle of the forest. I was thinking about returning but I decided in a matter of seconds to keep going since I had a lot speed on. I was rushing trough the forest. When I spotted the figure I couldn't see much since I was like 20 meter away but in seconds when I came closer I could see that it was a man in white jacket. Just standing there in darkness. Like I said my phone was keep putting out the light so I would have seen it if he had a light when my phone's light was off. So I'm going full speed towards the creepy guy standing next to the road. I was about 5 meter now from him and he was just standing there motionless. Like not even turning his head. Light goes out. 4 meter now. 3. 2. I put the light back on, and bypass him. I see him in the face. He was the most unhygienic looking man I've ever seen. Full nasty beard like a homeless guy just staring at the track. It was this moment I would feel a heavy rumble under my tires. I almost crashed. The track where the man stood was full off sticks and branches. Like a barricade. I think my mountain bike tires were saving my ass that day. Needless to say I have bike lights now and don't take that route at night anymore. My friend said they saw a cryptid when they were younger, around 9 years ago and that later they saw an image of it online. I've been searching for it, but with no luck, please help me find it. Here's the description they gave me. It was brown and flaky looking, roughly human sized and walked backwards on all fours and had long sharp tusk like teeth that went downwards. They said it looked scary and like it could hurt them but that wasn't aggressive. They saw it at night upon opening their back door in a city in New South Wales, Australia and said that it scampered through their house and that it was somewhat fast. I asked if it was a wandering Sigbin and they said it wasn't. I couldn't believe it when I heard the news about Larry Doyle Sanders. I've known him for years, and while he's always been a little eccentric, I never thought he was capable of something like this. It all started with a fishing trip. Larry and his friend Jimmy Knighton went noodling on the South Canadian River last Saturday. I wasn't there, but I heard from others that something went wrong. A confrontation occurred, and Jimmy didn't make it out alive. When authorities questioned Larry about what happened, 
His story was even more bizarre than anyone could have imagined. He claimed that Jimmy was planning to feed him to Sasquatch, also known as Bigfoot. According to the affidavit obtained by the Oklahoman, Larry said that Jimmy intended to feed him to Sasquatch slash Bigfoot. Larry believed that Jimmy was trying to escape so that Sasquatch could eat him. He couldn't let that happen, so he punched and struck Jimmy with a stick, and they fought on the ground for an extended period of time. It's hard to know what to believe. Did Larry really think Jimmy was trying to feed him to Sasquatch? Or was it just an excuse for his violent behavior? Either way, it's a tragic situation. Jimmy's body was found in the river the next day, and Larry has been arrested and charged with first-degree murder. I can't imagine what Jimmy's family is going through right now, and I'm sure Larry's family is in shock as well. It's a reminder that we never really know what someone is capable of, and how quickly a seemingly innocent situation can turn deadly. Sorry if I had a ton of unnecessary details but I don't know what is or is not relevant or important. Also I am unsure if this was a cryptic or black magic. This is my mom's encounter from the 60s when my mom was 15. I can't ask her really specific details because she hates talking about this encounter. When my mom was 15 she went with her aunt, aunt's friend, and two of her cousins to a small town near Cartagena, Colombia. They stayed with her other aunt, who apparently was into black magic, her son. My mom emphasized how she believed that aunt's son should have murders her if he had the chance. Black magic and also had a black cat that my mother described as strange and demonic. They stayed with her black magic aunt for three days. On the second day my mom, her normal aunt, and aunt's friend decided to punch holes into an old box, trap the cat, and put it on a car leading straight to Cartagena. That night they had their encounter. My mom said shortly after the sun set the house started to shake. It shook with such force that she believed that house would collapse. Her cousins were asleep before the house began to shake but her aunt and aunt's friend were awake. The three of them cowered in fear for hours. My mom managed to fall asleep because prayed the rosary while focusing on a Mary statue in her math class. In the morning after the house stoked shaking normal aunt and aunt's friend woke my mom and her cousins rushed them to a cab with their luggage and left before magic aunt or her son awoke. My mom has told this story thousands of time and I believe it to be 100% true. I'm curious about what she encounters that night and want to learn more about it. Any info will be greatly appreciated. I know it sounds like black magic but that cat makes me wonder. Also my mom did put food and water in the box as well as tell the driver about the cat and to let it out when they reached the city. I still remember the eerie feeling I had that night. It was dark, and my friend and I were walking to the service station just 5 minutes away from my house. We were talking about the Australian skinny boys, also known as the NSW body snatchers, when I warned my friend not to look into the trees or acknowledge anything strange. After grabbing some food, we decided to hang around the park for a bit. But as it started to get dark, we knew we had to make our way back. The paddock was almost right in front of my house, and I was familiar with the goats and horse that lived there, but I noticed there were no cows. Little did I know that was about to become important. As we were walking, we suddenly heard a screeching noise that sounded like a cow being attacked. I was unsure if I was hallucinating, so I turned to my friend and asked if she had heard it too. She confirmed that she did and that's when I knew we had to stay calm and quietly make our way to the front of my house. I could feel the anxiety rising within us as we walked, the feeling of being watched looming over us. This wasn't the first time this had happened to us. We had encountered a small snake that turned into a feral dog and chased us back to my house before. It seemed like we were always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Finally, we made it to the front of the house and breathed a sigh of relief. The rest of the night was spent with us feeling uneasy, but luckily, nothing else happened. Looking back on that night, I realized how important it was to stay calm and not make any sudden movements. 
It's always better to be safe than sorry, especially when it comes to encounters with unknown creatures. I believe that a lot of people get signs before something really bad is going to happen. Two nights ago I woke up screaming from a very lucid horrible dream where in the woods outside my house I heard someone in pain calling for help. I go to them and find a naked humanoid deer creature that turned on me. I believe that thing was a skinwalker. Then last night around 3 am I heard and felt what sounded like something very large hitting the side of my house. Very clearly I could tell it was happening in the area outside of my kitchen and either next to or below my kitchen window. I was in my living room sitting on the couch where there is even a wall between the living room and kitchen. But this sound was so loud it could be heard throughout the whole house and while I was already awake, the sound scared my cats, also woke up my sleeping daughter and partner. I could feel the wall behind me and the floor vibrate along with the dishes and kitchen cupboards rattling around from the impact. This happened at least twice I'm certain, maybe once more but after the second time I was so scared I ran to check on my family. There was about a 10 seconds pause between the sounds. After the dream I had I haven't been able to sleep in fear plus the loud noises are keeping me up too. Made sure to lock everything just in case. I'm wondering if the events are connected at all? If anyone can give me tips or help ease my mind I'd appreciate it. The other day I was driving home and as I came around a curve there was an animal that I thought was a goat at first. It ran away from me and got far enough away that I couldn't see it in my headlights. And it ran across the road and hid behind a bush. It was smart enough to pivot around the bush as I drove by it. It was extremely pale and looked like a camel shape. It moved like a Chinese dragon and looked like it was made out of a bedsheet. If y'all have any questions please ask I'm seriously trying to figure out what I saw natural or supernatural. Don't know if this helps but I'm from North Carolina and this all happened next to a cow pasture. Wasn't a cow because they only have brown cows no white ones. And I grew up around cows. They don't move look like that. It was probably about 4 to 5 feet tall and about 6 or feet long. It was a pretty big animal. When I was around 12-14 years old I used to ride my quad literally everywhere. My town was literally on top of a cliff overlooking the river next to a decent amount of woods. These woods were filled with Native American artifacts. It wasn't well known in fear that an archaeological group museum would come in and clear the land for anything that was left, there was also a burial ground the locals were trying to preserve. Plus I think it may be illegal. Anyway, there were still people who would dig next to the quad trails trying to find these artifacts. To dig for these artifacts you need to go abu less than a foot into the clay and usually that's where they'd be, to do this you only need small gardening tools. Hand trowel hand shovel etc, you wouldn't use anything bigger cause you'll dig too deep. While I was riding my quad one day with my friend on the back I came around a tight corner with no view what was around the turn because it was so grown in, going way too fast cause I was just a reckless kid, I came to a dead stop when a man was in the most misplaced spot right in the way of the trail. This isn't the biggest town. And growing up there my whole life there wasn't many people I didn't know especially in the woods because it was my frequent hangout and I've never seen this guy before. This trail was up above the trail where people normally dig, on the very top of the cliff overlooking the river where anyone would know not to dig for artifacts because it's too rocky. This guy was just as startled as I was. He nervously locked eyes with mine and we just stared at each other for a couple seconds. He doesn't say a word I don't say a word because he was creepy as hell look in and then he nervously blurts out him digging for arrowheads. I think I just gave him a head nod and because he was blocking the way I put the quad in reverse and started backing down the trail slowly, keeping eye contact the entire time. I took notice to the fact he had a regular wooden handled steel digging shovel with two large black garbage bags behind him, that were definitely filled with something. He had already dug a pretty big hole I'd say ATL is 3 foot deep and 5 foot wide. 
The tone in his voice was like he knew I didn't believe for a second he was digging for arrowheads, nobody that knew they were there was that uninformed on the tools needed to find them. Me and my friend both thought what was in those bags but as kids we kinda brushed it off and went about our day. It wasn't until a year or two later I really thought about it and I went back to the spot, I guess to dig them up and find out, I don't quite remember what my intentions were. That location was so grown and I couldn't pinpoint exactly where he was standing so I never did find it again. I tried a couple more times later but nothing ever came out of it. Until this day I always wonder why that guy was so shady if he was burying a human body or body parts, if so he was smart because people didn't venture up there and he knew it would only become more grown in. As a child saw a ghost of what looked like either an elderly miner or farmer. Except wearing a striped cap like railway workers wore in the 30s. In a section of our home's basement which was being extended. The opened up area was about 10 feet wide and equally deep. Was still mostly filled with dirt except for where the foundation had been knocked out to add the expanded room. He just sat in a crouch looking at me. I was about 10. And of course my family wrote it off as me being afraid of the dark, which I was. Years later my mom saw him too in the finished room. No idea who he was or why he was there. He never spoke. Still curious almost 50 years later about why he was there. When I was at university I had my crush over to watch a movie, it ended around midnight. As we were walking out of my living room I turned off the lights and gave her a hug. She buried her face in my neck, one of those cute sort of hugs. When she looked up she froze with her face just visible out of the corner of my eye. She had the most terrified expression and her arms just locked me in place. Never been that squeezed slash crushed before. I'm kinda chill at first like okay this is weird but not that weird. Then she just starts trembling and crying without moving her face at all and I'm just stuck there convinced she is seeing someone slash something over my shoulder. I start pushing her away and saying, this isn't funny what the f? She doesn't let go and this goes on for 2 minutes straight, meanwhile I'm just repeating, what the f, what the f, over and over, convinced I'm about to get stabbed or possessed by whatever the f she is staring at. She gave a shudder at the end and just glanced at me with a look that said, what's gotten into you? I say, what the F just happened? And she just stares at me blankly like she has no idea what I'm talking about. I told her she needed to leave and then I drove to spend the night at a friend's dorm room on the floor. Never been so freaked out in my life. For anyone wondering, I did see her again and more shit happened but never to that level of creep show. I'm a softie at heart and I figured the girl just needed help or had some level of emotional instability. Hello Horror Den. My name is Jake, and I'm a National Guard agent. My unit and I were deployed to a remote region in Appalachian Mountains to investigate the sudden disappearance of several hikers and campers. As we arrived, we were immediately met with fearful whispers and nervous glances from the few remaining locals. They told us terrifying stories of a creature called the Crawler, which had been spotted lurking in the shadows of the dense forest. Though the story seemed unbelievable, the fear in the eyes of those who had seen the Crawler was genuine. Unsettled but determined to find the missing people, my unit and I ventured deep into the uncharted wilderness. The locals gave us map of places where disappearances happened. Our search led us to a series of underground tunnels and caves, a hidden world that seemed to stretch on forever. As we descended further into darkness, our flashlights barely cutting through the gloom, we came face to face with the horrifying reality of the crawler. It was a monstrous being, unlike anything we'd ever seen, capable of hunting and killing with terrifying ease. We spotted it while it was devouring some corpse. We aimed our rifles, and started shooting. We knew we had to use our tactical training and survival instincts to evade the creature. The creature was fast, even killing few of our men, but in the end it fallen under the barrage of our bullets. 
As we approached the carcass of a cryptid, we noticed a stamp that said US government. As we returned to the surface, carrying the lifeless carcass of the crawler with us, we couldn't help but wonder what other secrets lay hidden in the uncharted wilderness. Our mission had succeeded, but the truth we discovered left us questioning the world we thought we knew. In the end, we'd vanquished a cryptid, but the secrets of government involvement that surrounded it would continue to haunt us. I was critically injured after being attacked by a large and powerful unknown creature. The attack took place one night in an abandoned building on the outskirts of town. My close friend and colleague, who was with me at the time, described what he witnessed that night, I was there with him. We were searching the building for a suspect when all of a sudden, something came rushing out of one of the rooms. It knocked me off my feet. When I got back up, he was being attacked by this monster. It was much stronger than anything I have seen. It was able to throw me 10 feet in the air with ease. My partner pulled up his firearm, firing it several times, but it wouldn't budge an inch, like the bullets didn't even bother it. I don't know what happened after that. I blacked out for several moments. When I came to, the creature had already disappeared, and I was unconscious, badly injured, and bleeding with a head injury and broken ribs. I remember seeing my partner pointing his firearm at an unknown creature. I felt my gun jam. When I looked up, the unknown being seemed to disappear in front of me. I went to check on my partner and found him not breathing. I was able to regain consciousness but quickly collapsed again shortly thereafter. Police officers were immediately dispatched to the scene. They took both of us to a nearby hospital for treatment. We both sustained serious injuries and were unable to work for several months during the recovery period. Sometimes, some of the scariest things don't necessarily have to be a torn up body or tons of blood. They just have to be unexplained. So, I work for the forestry department and I often travel around conducting various bits of research. I've gotten to travel far and wide, often ending up in the most remote and often beautiful places that would be extremely unlikely to see your average Joe ever go to, unless, like me, it was something to do with their job. Therefore, when you find something in one of these spots that has very obviously been left by a person, there is absolutely no rhyme or reason for it. You can't help but jump to nefarious conclusions. So, when you're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, up in the ass end of Canada with nothing around for miles, and you find a bed, it's kind of weird if not downright unnerving. And I want to be clear, I don't mean like some leaves and twigs, something somebody had created as a bed for themselves. I mean an actual single wooden bed, complete with rotten, moldy mattresses, multiple mattresses. Can you think of a singular reason why that would be there? There are no houses or any sort of building structures that used to be or are still there for miles and miles. In fact, the nearest road, I believe, is about 46 miles away, or in Canadian, 46 kilometers. There were no recent tracks except mine, although from the state of it, it did seem like it had been there for a very long time. It seemed like a very unusual place just to dump a bed you didn't want anymore, and also why? Who would haul a bed all the way out here? I ended up alerting the cops, wondering if maybe it had been used for a crime and dumped out here since it was unlikely anybody would ever find it, or maybe this was some kind of gang kill location. It seemed rather implausible, and thankfully, I couldn't see any obvious stains on the bed or around it, but who knew? I've never heard back about it, so I guess it wasn't the missing puzzle piece in some nationwide serial killer hunt, but I still can't think of a single good reason why it would have been there. My name is John, and I'm part of a National Guard unit assigned to protect the small town of Smallville, situated near a dense forest. The town had become the epicenter of a series of brutal attacks, and it was our job to protect the residents and track down the perpetrator. As we investigated the crime scenes, we found evidence of an unknown cryptid, 
which we suspected to be the legendary dog man. To aid in our search, we enlisted the help of a renowned cryptozoologist who had dedicated his life to studying these elusive creatures. Together, we delved deep into the surrounding woods, determined to confront the creature and put an end to the carnage. As we got closer to the truth, we uncovered a long buried secret about the government's involvement in the creation and cover-up of these creatures. It was a chilling revelation that made us question everything we thought we knew about the world around us. One night, while we were searching for the creature, we heard blood-curdling screams echoing from the small town. Rushing back, our hearts pounded in our chests as we realized the horrifying truth. The entire town was gone, and all its inhabitants had been mercilessly killed. We were devastated and felt an overwhelming sense of guilt, knowing that we had failed to protect the people we had been assigned to safeguard. But before we could even begin to process what had happened, government officials arrived at the scene. They quickly quarantined the area and ordered us to return home, offering no explanation or consolation. We left Smallville with heavy hearts, haunted by the loss of an entire community and the knowledge that we had been so close to uncovering the truth about the dog man. The government had successfully silenced us and covered up their dark secrets, but the memory of Smallville and its people would remain with us forever. My best friend Vinny and I were out riding our motor scooter on a beautiful sunny day. We had been coasting downhill when the road started to rise, so we kicked on the motor, approaching a level overlook area of a clear cut about the size of two football fields. Before us, at the far end of the field, down below near the trees, something astonishing caught our eyes. A massive creature arose from a fetal sleeping position, it was a Bigfoot. It looked straight at us before swiftly heading south with its arms swinging. As it passed a stump, it took one giant step up into the forest and disappeared from view. We almost fell off our scooter, scrambling to grab our camera and binoculars while trying to process what we had just witnessed. The creature was huge, with a flat face that clearly wasn't a gorilla. Vinny insisted that we explore the area, so we carefully walked down several feet of clear-cut debris to the spot where the Bigfoot had been sleeping. All we found were impressions where the creature had been lying down, but nothing else. We noticed that the stump it had passed was eight feet tall, and the creature had been chest high over it. The single step it took into the forest was at least three feet tall. We were both in awe and terrified at the same time. It was October 1993, and my cousin Jane and I were excited to embark on an elk hunting trip on Vinegar Hill. The area was known for its abundance of elk, and we were hoping to bag a big one. Little did we know that our hunting trip would turn into an unforgettable adventure. As we trekked along the creek, we came across a large muddy spot. To our surprise, we found five enormous Bigfoot tracks leading into the mud. Each track measured 20 inches long, and they were spaced far apart. Jane and I exchanged puzzled glances, wondering if what we were seeing was real. The following year, during elk bow hunting season, we found ourselves back in the same area. The memory of the Bigfoot track still fresh in our minds, we couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. As we hunted in the daylight around 2 p.m., we suddenly heard a loud, piercing eek sound echoing through the forest. Startled, we both dashed back to camp, our hearts pounding. At sunset, our friend Jeremy joined us at camp. As we discussed the day's events, Jeremy noticed movement by a bush in between three trees. He squinted, trying to make out what he was seeing. In the fading light, he saw a dark, shaded figure moving through the trees. It was tall, around six and a half to seven feet and walked upright like a human. At first, Jeremy thought it might be his brother, but as the figure disappeared into the woods, he realized it was something else entirely. We couldn't help but think back to the Bigfoot tracks we had found the previous year. Could it be that we had just seen the elusive creature responsible for those massive footprints? We later learned that the area was honeycombed with mines, raising the question of whether these creatures used them as shelter. 
Though we never had another encounter with the mysterious figure, our elk hunting trips on Vinegar Hill would forever be tinted with a sense of wonder and curiosity about the legendary Bigfoot. It was a beautiful day during archery season, and I decided to venture out on my usual morning hunt. The sun felt so warm and inviting that I couldn't resist the urge to take a nap before embarking on my late afternoon hunt back to camp. I found a perfect spot under a tree overlooking a dry creek bed with a large patch of young pine trees about 7 to 10 feet tall at the top of the clearing. The area then opened up into a 50 by 75 yard clearing, surrounded by mostly separated timber. The small pine tree location was fairly dense. I remember being jolted awake by loud thumping noises, like heavy objects hitting solid dirt and tree branches snapping. I instantly thought, here come the elk. So, I pulled myself together and eagerly prepared to see some elk emerging from the small pine trees. Instead, what I saw next left me baffled and uneasy. Large rocks, weighing 50 to 100 pounds, were being hurled through the air. They seemed to be coming from within the pine tree patch, and the commotion lasted for what felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was only about one to two minutes. I was completely taken aback. I had seen over 30 bears in the wild, had close encounters, and even observed them with spotting scopes, but what I was witnessing now was utterly unexplainable. I was certain that this was not a bear, bears roll rocks, but they don't throw 50 to 100 pound rocks. After the situation settled down, I cautiously walked back to camp and anxiously waited for my dad to return. The next day, I took my dad to the spot where I had experienced the strange event. We examined the rocks and found the exact spots where they had been removed from the ground. We could even see where the rocks had hit the ground and bounced. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any tracks since the ground was really hard, and there was a lot of grass undergrowth. My dad and I were left with more questions than answers, but one thing was for sure, something extraordinary and inexplicable had happened that day in the dense pine tree patch. This happened about 8 years ago when I was 11, I was over at my best friend's house for a sleepover. We, my best friend, his older brother, and I, we're all sitting around wondering what to do when older brother suggests we go to the park at which we happily agree. Now something to know, this park wasn't actually a park at all, it was actually a small and dense patch of forest in the middle of the suburb where my best friend lived. So we all get ready and make the 5 minute walk down there, we are there for about half an hour when we decide to stop and take a break in the middle of the forest. As we were sitting there we thought it would be fun to do the whistle from the Hunger Games, the movie had just come out and we were all obsessed with it at the time. So we all started doing it until the brother told us to be quiet, at first we didn't know when but then we heard it, a faint whistle back. The brother did it again and again there was a reply only this time it was closer and it kept getting closer. We all froze not sure of what to do until it seemed to stop, we all agreed it was time to go home at this point and as we were about to come out of where we hit I heard from a bush behind me hey, come here. And you can bet we took off running, as we were running I swear I could hear someone running after us so I turned my head back to look and when I turned back I ran I first into a tree branch, I took a nasty fall hitting my head. I don't really remember what happened after but my friend and his brother must have carried me out because the next thing I remember was my best friend over me asking if I was okay and we were in the field on the opposite end of where we entered. I had a black eye from the stick and a mild concussion from the full, the boys were both covered in cuts and bruises from running through the woods. We have never been back there since, we are all adults now my best friend 18, his brother 20 and I 19 and we still talk about it and speculate on who or what that could have been. My friend and I were excited to go hunting on Gowdyville Road, just over the top of Gowdyville Mountain. The area was known for its abundance of game, and we were eager to test our skills and enjoy a day outdoors. As we trekked deeper into the woods, 
The sound of leaves crunching beneath our feet filled the air. I was following closely behind my friend, keeping an eye out for any signs of movement in the trees. Suddenly, my friend stopped so abruptly that I accidentally hit him in the back with my rifle. Startled, I asked him what was wrong. Look at this, he whispered, pointing to the ground. In the soft mud, we found several large tracks, each measuring about 16 inches long. They were unlike anything we had ever seen before. The tracks appeared to have been made by a large, bipedal creature, leaving us both feeling a mix of excitement and fear. We cautiously followed the tracks, trying to determine where they might lead. As we continued along the path, we couldn't help but discuss the possibility that these tracks belonged to the legendary Bigfoot. We knew that the area was home to many stories of sightings and encounters, but neither of us had ever expected to find such compelling evidence ourselves. After tracking the mysterious prints for what felt like hours, we eventually lost the trail. The tracks seemed to vanish as suddenly as they had appeared, leaving us with more questions than answers. We returned to our campsite, still buzzing with adrenaline from our discovery. That night, as we sat around the campfire, we couldn't stop talking about the tracks we had found earlier. We debated whether we should report our find or keep it to ourselves, fearing that others might not believe our story. In the end, we decided to share our experience with a few trusted friends and family members, hoping that our discovery would add to the growing body of evidence surrounding the existence of Bigfoot. Though we never found any further proof of the creature during our hunting trips, the memory of that day on Gowdyville Mountain would stay with us forever, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that still lie hidden in the wilderness. While on a deer hunting trip my father stopped the vehicle on the side of the road to have lunch. As myself and my three brothers ate I noticed movement several hundred yards away out of my peripheral vision. I realized that something was up in a tree near the very top of a huge pine tree where the branches are just beginning to grow, at the edge of the timber cutting area. The area had just recently been logged. I looked at it with binoculars and was frightened when I realized that it was not a bear, but a huge man-like creature picking something from the treetop. I looked at it for several minutes. It was very dark brown and had its legs and at least one arm wrapped around the tree. It kept reaching up and grabbing stuff like it was collecting something. Then suddenly it turned to look in my direction when I saw the face very clearly. It had no hair near the eyes and nose which looked humanoid and definitely did not have a snout like a bear at all. Then it did a double look then realized that we were watching it, and without any notice just pushed itself away from the tree and free fell at least 60 feet to the ground with its feet and body staying in the prone position all the way. When it landed it made a very loud crashing sound into the freshly logged clear cut. My father screamed at us to hurry and get into the vehicle and we drove away fast and he never talked about it to me again. My brothers did not see it because they were looking in the wrong direction with their binoculars. Very spooky though. I had just finished a long walk through the forest. The smell of decomposing leaves filled the air, but suddenly, I caught a whiff of something far more pungent. It was like a rotting animal carcass. As the smell intensified, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. As I walked down our dirt driveway, I heard a deep snort, like a huffing noise. It reminded me of the sound a horse makes when it wants your attention. Intrigued, I looked around and saw a large male Bigfoot standing there, staring right at me. I was both fascinated and terrified at the same time. With my heart pounding, I took a cautious step, and to my amazement, the Bigfoot mirrored my movement. This continued for about five minutes, with the creature copying my every action. Feeling a mix of excitement and fear, I decided to run back to my house to grab a camera. As I fumbled to find my camera, I thought about the park ranger, who had been a friend and confidant for years. He had shared numerous stories about unusual sightings and unexplained phenomena in the forest. I couldn't wait to tell him about my encounter and show him the evidence. But when I finally stepped outside, camera in hand, 
the Bigfoot was gone. Disappointed but still eager to share my story, I went to the ranger station and relayed my experience to him. The park ranger listened intently, his eyes widening with each detail I shared. He told me that there had been other reports of similar encounters in the area, and my story only added to the growing mystery. Together, we went back to the spot where I had seen the Bigfoot, but there was no trace of the creature. The park ranger promised to keep an eye out for any future sightings and urged me to do the same. From that day on, every time I ventured into the forest, I couldn't help but hope for another chance encounter with the elusive Bigfoot. My ex-wife and I saw in plain sight a female cross the road in front of our car. We had to stop very quickly or we would hit her. This happened at around 9.30 PM. We went back there the next morning and found where two to three had been standing watching traffic to cross the road. From 2000 through 2004 I heard many different calls from my bedroom from various times. The oddest at 9.30 am. This was the loudest call I had heard and it sounded like it was lost or looking for a younger one that was lost. I have never heard a creature with such a lung capacity. The volume was incredible and that was in broad daylight about half mile from my home. It woke me up immediately and I knew right away what it was. I have excellent audio tape recordings that I recorded as I heard them through a magnified microphone. Many times I had walked in the woods by the house and I felt the presence of them around me. I also found many footprints and the largest pile of feces that I had ever seen and my dog was very leery of that. I like to look for new, out of the way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip about 10 years ago I'm in western Pennsylvania and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out of the way stream that I found on the map. I'm in the country, it's not too desolate. But house are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I am really close to where this stream is supposed to be so I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction I believe this stream to be. The road starts out in okay shape but as soon as I pass into the tree line stuff gets weird. It's mid afternoon, but the canopy of trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely if ever gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random spots in the road, first sporadically and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It looks like they were placed on purpose. My car is 4WD but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger and combine this with how tight the road now is and driving around them is becoming sketchy. I'm now driving very slow to not pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. The road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn but stop as I see the road continuing this weird downward trajectory. At this moment my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around but it's at this point I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it but I didn't want to get my front end caught on something pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck. I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you are bound to get just enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way driving this weird, Downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first it just garbage. Bottles, boxes, wrappers, etc. Then I start seeing toys. Kids toys. Lots of them. An uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they've been there for years and some look fairly new. The amount of clothes I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not one random mattress. Lots of mattresses. All over the place. There are dirty and dark stains on them. 
My gut is now screaming at me to get the F out, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out my next move I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse dodging all of the random rocks and all the way back up and out the sharp turns until the path levels out again. I go full F this mode and risk making the three point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. All I know is that ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts telling me to get out, I get out. This happened about a year ago to me and my husband. Sorry in advance for the long story. It was our 10th anniversary, so we decided to go camping, just the two of us, and of course our dog. There is a big national park camping area near where we live, little less than an hour drive, so that was where we were heading. It's basically a big forest with many small lakes, ponds, trails and camping sites around. Pretty popular place during summer, but we still saw some people, even though it was late September and the weather was cold. We found a good spot, next to a lake, to set up our camp. It was a beautiful day, so we wanted to hike a bit in the forest. There was a nice long path that was going around the lake where we had our camp, so we chose to go that way. The lake was quite small, and there was another camping site by it. You could see there from our camp, and from there you could see our camp, they were almost on opposite sides of the lake. We walked past the another camp, and saw a man there alone just standing and staring us, not answering when we greeted him. He was maybe in his late twenties, around the same age as us. I thought at that point, that he was maybe just shy and little weird. He had a small tent set up and some other stuff all around the place, so I figured he had been there a while. We just continued walking and didn't think much to it. Eventually we got to our camp, and started to set up our tent before it's too dark. We made some food by the fire, and just sat there enjoying the peace. Suddenly, our dog starts barking like crazy. She was tied to a long wire around a tree. We immediately realized that she wasn't just paranoid and that there really was something in the woods and it was near. It had been very dark for hours at that point. I took the dog to a leash and my husband started to look around with his bright headlamp. Our dog just kept barking. We were confused and sure it was some kind of animal, maybe a bear or a moose, but we couldn't understand why it wasn't scared of us and why it wouldn't run away. My husband went ahead to the path that leads to the another camp. Right when he got to the path, which was just less than 10 meters away from our camp, he saw something on the ground. I told him to go check it out and followed with our dog. He stopped, turned at me and said, it's a human. Laying on the ground. The first thing I thought was that maybe they were hurt, or dead or something. They just laid there not moving, facing the ground. We asked are you okay, are you hurt? And they just suddenly stood up. Turned out, it was the guy from the another camp. He was very scared of our dog, and told me not to let her near him. I was kinda relieved, that it wasn't some creepy ass bear that was going to eat us, but I soon learned that a bear might have been less scarier than this guy. After he stood up, he walked straight to our campfire and sat down. My husband tried to ask him multiple times why he was sneaking in the dark forest without any light. He didn't give us any answer. We even laughed a bit and told him how we thought he was a damn bear or some shit, but he didn't even smile, just stared at the fire looking annoyed. His right leg was soaking wet, he probably stepped off the path and dipped it in the lake on his way to our camp. He sat with us for 30 minutes, not talking much. He also clearly wanted to know where our dog was at all times. I saw he had a knife hanging from his belt, but I guess it's not that weird when you're in the woods. Every few minutes he put his hand in his pocket and just peeked of whatever was in there, Kind of like checking the time on your phone without taking it from your pocket, but it wasn't a phone he had there. 
I felt very uncomfortable and anxious by the whole situation. So, when the 30 minutes had passed, he again stood up and mumbled about going back to his own camp, and left. He never gave us any explanation of why he came to our camp, or why he was stalking us in the dark. He tried very hard not to be seen when we found him. When I thought he was far enough, I told my husband that Therese no way I'm sleeping in that tent. The biggest nope ever. Fortunately for me, he agreed and said that the guy might come back when are sleeping. I just wanted to leave ASAP, so my husband started packing things up, our car was nearby, thank god, and I was guarding and looking around with a light if he comes back. Just when we had almost all of our stuff in the car, I saw a quick flash of light on the path from the guy's camp towards ours. He was coming back. Maybe he thought we went to sleep, because he couldn't see our campfire anymore. So yeah, we got in the car and left real quick. I don't know if we overreacted, but I had such a bad feeling about him. Who crawls in the dark, wet forest alone just to stalk some strangers? What would have he done, if our dog wouldn't have hurt him? What were his motives? Maybe stab us to death when we're sleeping? I don't know and didn't want to stay there and find out. I'm just glad we had our dog with us. There's a chance she saved our lives. I think people are the scariest thing to find at night when you're camping. It was about a year ago when I went to visit a friend for some casual drinks, but as the night wore on, we ended up having more than just one beer. Time passed quickly, and before I knew it, I had missed my last train home. My friend, being the ungracious host that he is, didn't offer to let me stay over for the night. Left with no other choice, I had to embark on a two-hour walk in the freezing cold. With the temperature at minus 10 degrees Celsius and my body still buzzing from the alcohol, I wasn't exactly thrilled about the situation. As I reached the halfway point, I found myself walking near the woods on a narrow path, just wide enough for a car to pass. Out of nowhere, a car pulled up behind me, slowly drove past, and then, about 50 meters ahead, made a U-turn before coming back. I was already feeling weirded out, but then the car did the same thing again. By the time the car seemed poised to repeat the maneuver for a third time, I was so creeped out that I just started sprinting. Maybe it was just a stranger who was curious about what I was doing there alone, or maybe it was something far more sinister. I'll never really know. Regardless of the driver's intentions, that night remains etched in my memory as one of the creepiest experiences I've ever had. The combination of being alone in the cold, near the woods, and being pursued by an unknown driver is something I'll never forget. It was a night like any other, with the only exception being the unsettling behavior of our two normally placid black Labradors. They woke me up from my sleep, making an awful growling and barking sound I had never heard them make before. Their voices were filled with aggression and fear, which was unusual for them. We lived in the countryside, with a vast common and woods situated behind our house. I walked into the kitchen to find the dogs glaring at the back door, continuing to make a fuss. Their terror was palpable, causing the hair on the back of my neck to stand up. Grabbing a torch and arming myself with a fire poker, I prepared for the possibility of an intruder. I opened the back door, only to find that both dogs shied away and ran into another room. The night was pitch dark as I poked my head and the torch out the back door. For a split second, I caught a glimpse of reflective eyes belonging to a massive creature about 10 meters away from me. The creature blinked and turned away, disappearing almost instantly. In England, there was nothing I could think of that could explain such an encounter. I slammed the door shut, and my dogs and I spent the rest of the night huddled together in my bedroom, half terrified. Not long after that night, the local paper featured an article about a series of unexplained sheep deaths on a farm just a mile away from our home. The sheep had been ripped to shreds, as if they had been attacked by a large predator. The chilling coincidence left me wondering what kind of creature had paid us a visit that fateful night.
I lived and worked in the southern coastal town of Albany in Western Australia for a number of years where my job required me to travel to various rural communities around the region. I was returning home along a very flat and long stretch of Albany Highway in the afternoon when I had to overtake a farmer in his old ute, Australian for pickup truck. So far so very typical of traveling along your average country road but as I pulled in ahead of him I checked my rear view mirror as I always did and even though this happened over 25 years ago, I can still vividly recall the absolute confusion when I saw there was no car behind me on the road at all. This wasn't at night but about 1 pm in the afternoon, there was no sun in my eyes or shadows on the road or any roads he could have suddenly turned down. I was easily going around 110 km an hour which meant he was going about 9100 km. I literally looked up into the rear vision mirror as I pulled into the correct lane so I cannot believe he could have slowed down and turned into a side road at that speed, or without me seeing him. No trees, flat paddocks both sides. I'm still absolutely flummoxed to this day as to what happened, even as I'm typing this I'm pretty creeped out remembering how it affected me. It really was like something out of a Stephen King novel. This is the first time I have recalled this story since it happened, weird and bloody creepy but true. Robert and I were riding our Vespa motor scooter. We had been coasting down and then the road arose and we kicked on the motor, as we approached the level overlook area of a clear cut about the size of two football fields. Before us, as the far end of field, down below near the trees arose from fetal sleeping position a big foot. It looked at us and headed south with swinging arms. It passed a stump then several feet later it took one step up into the forest. We almost fell off the bike, trying to get camera, binox and understand what we saw. It was big. Certainly not a gorilla with a flat face. Robert required we explore the area. So we walked down several feet of clear-cut rubbish to road along the trees. We saw where he had been sleeping, but nothing else except, the stump he passed was 8 feet tall and he was chest high over it. Where he went into the forest, the single step was 3 feet tall or more. Yikes! We reported and were recorded with Bigfoot researchers. They said that they believed us. Particularly because the Bigfoot is known to be nocturnal. Day sleepers but no one had yet seen one sleeping. My wife and I had planned a peaceful getaway to a cabin in a rural town nestled in the mountains. It was a much needed break from our busy lives, and we were excited to enjoy the serenity of nature. It was around 8 pm when we heard an air raid siren, which we assumed was related to a fire. The sound pierced the quiet evening and it rang out for quite some time. We initially joked about it being the beginning of a zombie apocalypse, but as time passed, we couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. We didn't know what the siren was for, and our curiosity got the better of us. Deciding it was best to find out what was going on, I put on my coat and boots before venturing out into the chilly night. I walked down the road to a small grocery store nearby, hoping someone there might know the reason for the siren. As I entered the store, the warm air and bright lights provided a welcome contrast to the cold darkness outside. I approached the counter and asked the store clerk if they knew what the siren was for. To my surprise, they looked at me with a puzzled expression and replied, what siren? I couldn't believe that they hadn't heard it. I stepped back outside, expecting to hear the siren again, but it had stopped. The eerie silence that had returned was unsettling. I made my way back to the cabin, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Upon my return, I shared the strange encounter with my wife. We were both left with a lingering sense of unease, but we tried to brush it off and enjoy the rest of our stay. However, we couldn't help but wonder about that mysterious siren and why nobody else seemed to have heard it. The mystery of that night would stay with us long after we left the mountains. A few years back, I had this really creepy experience with an older co-worker of mine that still kind of shakes me to this day. 
It happened at this place that I'd been working at for a couple of years at that point. The place was a small factory of sorts, with only less than a handful of employees, including myself. One day though, my boss introduced us to this new, older guy that he'd brought in to start working in the other, newer side of the factory. You see, the factory where he worked had two different sides to it. One side for beeswax and one side for wood production. My boss had brought him in because they went to church together and the wood production on the other side had a religious significance. The new, older co-worker worked there with us for about one month before he approached me one day and introduced himself to me. He seemed like a nice guy and even came back to give me a Hershey kiss not long after that. A couple months later, I got asked by our boss if I could go pick up my new older co-worker, probably because his car was broken down or something. I agreed to it, so my boss asked me if it was okay to give the co-worker my phone number so that we could coordinate via text. I said it was fine and went on my way. I brought him back to the factory with no problems. Soon after that though, I started to get random and sporadic texts from him late at night. At first, the texts were just about us maybe hanging out soon while simultaneously apologizing to me because he knew he was much older than I but then the texts started to get pretty pervy and they would be as long as a mini book. The texts were just long, misspelled random, pervy compilations. I tried to just ignore the texts, but that only made them start coming more frequently. In the midst of all this one day, my roommates were scrounging for a ride to a casino only a few miles from our house. I gave them a few dollars for a ride and they said that they'd find their own ride back. So imagine my surprise, when they returned only a couple hours later with their own ride alright. Their ride was my creepy co-worker. Not only was I creeped the hell out that this pervy jerk now knew where I lived, but I also didn't know how he came to give my roommates that ride. Was it just sheer coincidence or something more? A few days after that. I went to visit a friend at his apartment that was located on our main street running through our small, historic downtown area. When I came downstairs from his apartment, as he was located on the second floor, I made my usual turn, walking on the sidewalk in front of all the main street shops. As I walked past one of the shops that was maybe two doors down from my friend's apartment, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye, but it couldn't be could it? To my great dismay it was him, my creepiest older co-worker standing in the doorway of one of the shops and smiling creepily at me from under a black top hat. A couple of weeks after that little incident, I noticed him again as I left my friend's apartment. He was just standing on the sidewalk with that same creepy grin plastered on his gaunt face. Since I had already informed my friend after the last incident, I simply texted him real quick to let him know the creep was back. I got into my car and left after sending the text, so I didn't find out until later that the creepy co-worker was gone by the time my friend got downstairs to the sidewalk. At that point though, the texts were still coming even faster than before. He was even threatening to come by my house if I didn't respond. Long, provocative texts dictating what he'd like to have happened between us if he did just happen to show up at my house. When I would see him during the day at work though, he would act as though everything were normal, giving no hint of his nighttime persona. After seeing him yet again as I left my friend's apartment, I just so happened to overhear a couple co-workers of mine standing around discussing how weird our new, older co-worker was. Right then, I stepped in and joined the convo, finally showing one of my other co-workers the text messages that the creep had been sending me. I had been working with that particular co-worker for a few years, but I didn't know him too well. He was one of those people who came off kind of grumpy and distant. Still, I told him and my other co-worker not to say anything. They both nodded in agreement and we went our separate ways to finish up for the day. When I came into work the next day though, my boss immediately called me into his office. My boss told me that he'd been informed of the situation and the texts and he wanted to see my phone to read them. I told my boss that I didn't really want to get anyone in trouble, but he said that was besides the point and that my situation needed to be addressed. My boss also stated that my older coworker had no right or reason to be texting me and talking to me the way he was talking to me. 
The boss must have had a pretty good talk with him because all the crap stopped from the older coworker after that. The other grumpy coworker of mine apologized to me for saying something to the boss, but I completely understood and I was actually pretty grateful to him for that. I should have been the one to take the initiative to talk to the boss about it, but I was just too chicken. Fortunately though, that situation seemed to work out for all involved, because life went on as usual and everyone involved acted as though nothing had ever happened. Well, I can't really say that because that situation actually caused the grumpy coworker and I to talk more and we started dating. We were together for about 3 years and then we got married. I was in Cozumel, Mexico, driving a truck through a completely uninhabited area on my way to a beautiful, secluded beach. The sun was shining, and I was eager to relax on the pristine sand, soak up some rays, and enjoy the crystal clear water. As I continued down the deserted road, I suddenly spotted something up ahead. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. This strange creature looked like a stick figure drawing with a disproportionately large head and a spindly body. It was all black and stood on its hind legs, seemingly aware of my presence. Without any warning, the bizarre creature darted across the road right in front of my truck. I slammed on the brakes, barely managing to avoid hitting it. My heart was pounding, and I stared in disbelief as it disappeared into the dense jungle. Shaken by the encounter, I continued on my way to the beach, but I couldn't get the image of that creepy thing out of my mind. When I met up with my friends, I told them about what I had seen and even drew a sketch of the creature. They were just as baffled as I was, unable to identify it based on my description or drawings. Over the years, I've tried to find out what that strange creature could have been. I've researched every known animal that inhabits Cozumel, but nothing seems to match the stick figure-like being I saw that day. Even my friends who still live on the island haven't been able to figure out what it was. To this day, the memory of that eerie encounter lingers in my mind. I can't help but wonder what it was that crossed my path in the uninhabited wilderness of Cozumel. Perhaps it was a creature yet to be discovered by science, or maybe it was something supernatural. Whatever it was, it remains an unsolved mystery that continues to haunt me. I grew up on a ranch, in a small, old California ranch house. Lots of windows to stay cool on the summer, almost all the rooms open to the central living room. I was probably 14, my father was 11, and my mom was out that night running an errand. Brother and I are together in the living room. He's sitting by the stove and I'm lying on the sofa, we're both doing homework. Inside the lights are on, but through the windows it's pitch black. As I'm reading I hear footsteps on the mud porch leading up the front door. It's an old house, and I hear the heavy footsteps clearly. But I hadn't seen my mom's car drive in. I hadn't seen or heard any car. It's the country, I would have heard a car approaching and seen their headlights through the dark windows. But there was nothing, just the footsteps on the porch. They stop at the front door, but no one knocks. I am frozen. If I had gotten up and looked around the corner through the kitchen, I would have seen the owner of the food steps standing at the door, which had a window. But then they would have seen me. If I talk to my brother, they'll hear me. And in the dark, anyone could be looking through the windows at us, but we couldn't see out. I go through all my options. The person is standing at the only door in or out of the house, which is always unlocked. If I go to the kitchen to grab a knife, they will see me and know I see them. We can't hide, the house is too small and they'll see where we go. My heart is racing. My best option is to pretend I don't know for as long as I can, and be ready for whatever comes next. But after a few minutes, I don't hear any more footsteps. I calm down. I might have just imagined it. 20 minutes later I hear my mom's car and see the headlights go across the windows. I run outside because I'm still a child and I want my mother to know how scared I am. But before I can tell her she asks me, who left the water on? And I'm terrified again. 
We had this weird water spigot in the front yard, with a pole that shot up to about waist height and a spigot turned up instead of down. My brother and I would treat it like a drinking fountain or turn it on full blast and play under it like a fountain. When she got home the water was on, full blast, shooting several feet up into the air. Someone had been there that night, on our porch. They saw my brother and I, alone, no car in the drive. They didn't come in, but they wanted us to know they could have. My family and I once lived back in some of my family's woods. No one could see our little plot, just woods all around. My family lived nearby but down the dirt road away. We had no light poles put up so it would get very dark back there. I started to notice a light above the trees. I figured out it was not a star because it would sway, rise quickly, totally disappear, descend behind the trees. This went on for a few days and I was the only one who had seen it. My dad hired some guys to help him with a deck. My husband sort of knew one and would invite him to dinner after they worked. That light always seemed to get closer when that guy was there. It was even at tree level often. I knew this because I could see the light behind the trees, obviously not in the sky. I showed it to my husband, kids, and the guy. Not mentioning it earlier in case I was crazy. My daughter decided to play with it, she said follow me if you're an alien. Then she walked to the left, and it went to the left. She went right and it did too. She went right again, it followed. That freaked me the hell out. The guy was so freaked out that he left. And the light followed him. It freaking followed him as he left. I edited to add this. I should also say that this man lived in the woods behind us. So it was easy to see the light descend to where he lived. He wasn't very far from us at all just separated by woods. For about four days, that light would follow that man when he left. I thought he was about to get abducted by aliens. I would stare out the window, peering into the darkness for hours because I feared missing a Mel Gibson signs birthday party like moment that would verify my fears. One night the man did not come. The light was still there freaking me out. I had just about lost my mind at this point worried about my kids being abducted by aliens. I yelled at it. What's your problem, huh? What do you want? It was following me walking as I lost my shit. I ended up flipping at the bird and it seemed to dive towards me. I kid you not, in that moment, I thought I had pissed the aliens off and they were about to crash into me. Then it disappeared during the time I had my back to it running for my life. I told my father what was going on. His response was are you on crack? I got irate and had to explain that, no, I was not on crack. He gave me a shotgun and told me to just shoot it down next time I saw it. If it is real. It only came back when that man came back and it left when he left. I did not shoot it down because I figured a shotgun would just piss off aliens. Never saw it again and lived in fear of aliens in the dark woods for the rest of our stay there. Years later, I was reading local news and stumbled across an article that explained the lights. It was an article about how the local cops use drones to catch drug dealers and other nefarious folks. My jaw dropped. I was about 21 when all that happened and more naive than I am now. Also, this was back before drones were so popular and well known, especially for someone who didn't really use the internet much during that time. I remembered how not long after completing the deck, that man who was visiting us was arrested for drug charges and some other stuff involving the Mexican Mafia as it was called. We were pretty shocked because we figured he was just a regular old drug dealer, which we don't have an issue with. Mafia stuff though. We didn't like that being near our kids. So I spent a portion of my life terrified of aliens when it was more than likely the police using drones. Whoever was manning the drone was probably bored and decided to mess with us. Or they didn't want the guy or us to catch on so they went with making us believe they were aliens. Or they were actually aliens and I came up with a reason that my brain can handle better. If it was cops and I had shot it like my father told me to, I would probably still be in prison today. So glad I didn't do that.
My wife, kids, and I live in 30 miles or so outside of town on 100 acres. The house sits half a mile off the main road. My wife wanted the works for security when we got the place, so I did a gate, driveway doorbell past the gate, cameras at the gate and at the house, alarm system, two new puppies, you name it. I've always lived way out my whole life so I'm used to the hog squeals, coyote screams, deer huffing, all that jazz. One night around 2 AM I heard a loud shatter and instantly it was covered by the alarm siren for the house. The main keypad is in our bedroom and I look to see the glass break sensor in our son's bedroom has tripped. I thinking the worst, grab a shotgun kept for rattlesnakes and run to his bedroom hollering for my wife to grab our youngest from his crib just in case. I hear my oldest son screaming, I'm shaking so violently I can barely turn the door knob. My adrenaline fight response is completely taken over. I throw the door open let out a war cry trying to intimidate a would-be intruder, and my son is clinging to the crib rails and glass is all over the floor. I can just feel the cold winter air snapping through the room. I shut his bedroom door behind me grab him up, and frantically check the bathroom, his closet, anywhere in the area I thought the intruder would be. I yell for my wife again. Living this far out we have a system if someone is ever in the house and one of us knows but we don't want to alert the intruder, she gives a response indicating she's alone still and okay. I take my son to my wife and hand her the shotgun telling her I'll grab the rifle and check around inside and out. I grab a flashlight and my rifle I scan the entire house. I walk outside and hit the auto lock on the deadbolt I quickly make my way around to the back side of the house to the busted window. My adrenaline has started coming down and I'm logically telling myself it had to have been a deer right? Saw his reflection buck the window, window broke. That's got to be it. I checked high and low all around the house and never found any indication to what it was. I checked the cameras and couldn't find anything around the house at that time either. I couldn't sleep the rest of the night, it took a few weeks for me to let my son sleep in his own bedroom again. I'm positive it was just a deer attacking his reflection. But I've always wondered if someone broke the window and heard the siren and immediately ran. Now, there was a blind spot watching that particular window. I've installed more cameras since the incident and I have one that points down each side of the house just to watch windows and entrances. Motion sensing flood lights on all four corners, and my favorite, one of our pups sleeps right beside his bed every night. It was a hot summer day, and I decided to go for a hike on a trail I had heard about from some friends. They had mentioned that it was common for people to skinny dip at the end of the hike, and the idea of taking a refreshing dip in the cool stream sounded like the perfect way to unwind after a long hike. As I walked along the trail, I saw a few people sunbathing in the distance. Wanting some privacy, I decided to head upstream to find a more secluded spot. As I continued along the path, I noticed a lone man on the trail. I politely stepped off to let him pass, assuming he would continue on his way. I finally found a quiet alcove where I felt comfortable enough to strip down and enjoy the cool water. I quickly undressed and submerged myself, feeling the refreshing sensation of the water against my skin. Just as I started to relax, I felt a sudden sense of unease. To my horror, the man from the trail reappeared, standing only a foot behind me, completely naked. He attempted to strike up a conversation, but my instincts were screaming at me that I was in danger. I muttered a response and quickly scrambled out of the water to get dressed. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, I began the three-mile hike back to my car at a rapid pace. With no cell service in the area, I knew I had to rely on my own instincts to keep myself safe. Every rustle in the bushes, every snapping twig, sent shivers down my spine as I hurried along the trail, praying that I would make it back to my car without incident. When I finally reached my car, I breathed a sigh of relief, grateful to have escaped the situation unharmed. From that day on, I vowed never to hike alone again, always opting for the company of friends on my outdoor adventures. 
The memory of that terrifying encounter serves as a constant reminder to trust my instincts and always prioritize my safety. It was a quiet night as I drove down the narrow country road, taking my friend back to his village after a long day of hanging out. The clock in the car read just after midnight, and the only source of light came from the dim glow of the headlights cutting through the darkness. As we approached a small bridge, I noticed a peculiar sight, a small cloud-like formation slowly drifting across the road. Just a bit of fog, I thought to myself, not an unusual occurrence on these country roads. My friend, lost in thought, was staring out the window, oblivious to the foggy apparition up ahead. As we got closer, I expected our car to pass through the fog, but what happened next left me baffled and frightened. Instead of us driving through the fog, the fog seemed to pass through the car itself. It seemed to defy the laws of nature, as the misty cloud moved right between the two of us and out through the back of the car. Startled, I jumped in my seat, gripping the steering wheel tightly. My friend, who hadn't been paying attention to the road, was equally shocked by the phenomenon. He confirmed that he had also witnessed the fog passing through the car, leaving us both bewildered and struggling to make sense of what had just happened. We spent the rest of the drive discussing our eerie encounter, trying to come up with a rational explanation for the strange fog. But to this day, the experience remains unexplained, a chilling memory that lingers in our minds whenever we find ourselves driving down those lonely country roads late at night. I had always loved the peace and tranquility of living on my five-acre property, surrounded by cow fields on all sides. My dogs were my only companions, and we had developed our own little routines, including singing silly songs together. One of the songs I often sang was the nursery rhyme Daisy, Daisy. It had become something of a tradition for me to sing this song to my pups as they wandered around our home, mostly indoors since they were indoor dogs. On a crisp fall evening, I found myself alone in the house with the windows wide open, enjoying the cool breeze that swept through. As I hummed the familiar tune of Daisy, Daisy to myself, I suddenly heard something that made my blood run cold. A faint, low whistle echoed through the air, mimicking the tune of Daisy, Daisy with eerie precision. The whistling was slow and deliberate, as if someone or something was taunting me. At the end of the verse, the whistling ceased, leaving an unsettling silence in its wake. Fear gripped my heart, and I couldn't bring myself to look outside to investigate the source of the haunting sound. I closed the windows, my heart pounding in my chest, and tried to shake off the unsettling feeling that had settled over me. To this day, I still don't know what caused that chilling whistle. The memory of that eerie night remains with me, a constant reminder that sometimes, the unknown can be far more terrifying than anything we can imagine. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.